Yeah. I'm sure, sure you did. I just it was like on the fly and all that. Oh, that's fine. Um, all right. Well, welcome to an in-person select board meeting that we haven't had. <laughs> <laughs> um, as everyone can see, there's also a Zoom meeting happening for anyone who's uncomfortable attending, um, which is completely fine. Um, obviously, there's new technology here, so we'll see how it goes. Um, so we'll start with the seven o'clock meeting for June seventh select board. Um, first motion for order business would be to approve the agenda. I have a motion to approve the agenda. A second? Mark. Yep. Um, Any changes? I was just wondering if we might move the mask mandate reopening discussion to right after the public. Let that be the first thing you talk about. Sure. And then uh, move up the uh, reorganization of the planning zoning department to the first item in the manager's item. Okay. So deed A and deed A, basically. So okay. Are you okay with those changes? Right. Um, and moves and seconds. Any further discussion or additions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, consent agenda items minutes of the May 17th meeting and the liquor license for Cabot Foods. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda items. Okay. Is there a second? Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Who seconded that? Me. Yeah. All right, moving on to public. This is the opportunity for the public uh, to speak on anything that's not currently on the agenda. Um, yes, I have something to report. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, I just, uh, since we've been doing Zoom, we've also just been stating that um, the pub, this isn't the only opportunity for the public to speak. You also can speak during any of the other agenda items. So. It's going to be a little interesting here with because mm -hmm. with Zoom, there's a raise in your hand. There's also a chat window, so we'll do our best. If you feel like you want to speak on a topic and we're missing you, just yell out or something, and we'll figure it out. And as we understand the technology, we'll learn more. But this is not your only opportunity to speak as the public. So with that, the floor. All right. Can um, the people on the on the uh, Zoom hear us? Yes, they can. So I think. Yep. But we can hear you. That's, that's the microphone, right? Yeah. So if you could come up to speak, so they can, so the people that are using Zoom can also hear you. Oh. Wow. <laughs> hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Skip Flanders, one of the uh, EFUD commissioners, and um, some of you remember back in January. Um, Actually, Everett Coffee was a longtime Waterbury resident and served on different boards, passed away in December. And I came to the uh, select board to see if you wanted to sign a resolution of sympathy listing uh, some of his uh, accomplishments and what he did for the community, which uh, Mark and I did. We approved it and the EFUD commissioners approved it. I think we signed it on January 11th or something like that. And uh, I have talked to members of the family about how they wanted us to present it to them, that Mark and I would offer to meet with them and things. Uh, there's four of them and things, and they never got together and got back to me. So they had Everett's uh, committal service and things. Um, I think it was May 22nd, in? Yeah. May 22nd, up in Waterbury Center Cemetery. So. I had this uh, resolution of sympathy. I said, well, I'm going to take it, go to the service, and give it to the family. And when I got there, there was an opportunity for the public um, or people in the audience to speak about Everett and things. I talked to um, the family and said, do you mind if I read this? So I did read it at the service and then handed it to Don Coffey, his oldest son. Lefty and I were there at the service, not representing anybody, but uh, so I think it ought to be in the minutes that we delivered that resolution of sympathy to the family on uh, May 22nd, and we'll put the same thing in the minutes of our input commissioners meeting on Wednesday. So, so I thank you for your effort to do it. The, the family was, um, you know, pleased with it and thanked us. Yeah, for doing it. So. Thank you for doing it at the um, at this uh, interment ceremony. Yeah. 
Well, Lefty and I spent a lot of hours in Hill 2 with uh, Everett. I don't know if he was ever on the select board, but he certainly attended a lot of meetings. He, he was here often. <laughs> so, we value his opinion. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, let's see, Erin has her hand up, so we'll go to Erin. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Erin Lander. I'm a resident of Waterbury on Shawmanton Road, speaking on behalf of the Waterbury Area Anti-Racism Coalition, also known as WARC, and our over 90 members. At the May 3rd, 2021 Select Board meeting, my colleague Erin Hurley read a statement from WARC requesting the resignation or removal of Chris Vienz from the vice chair position due to his history of racist statements and insufficient efforts by Chris to acknowledge or apologize for these statements. While we remain encouraged by the prospect of ongoing equity and anti-racism learning for the select board and town employees, we continue to request and encourage public accountability and transparent decision-making around the decision to elevate Chris to the vice chair position this March. Since the May 3rd meeting, municipal manager Bill Shepelek and three select board members, Mark, Danny, and Mike, had meetings that were in compliance with open meeting law with members of WARC to discuss this request, hear our concerns, and share their thoughts. We really appreciate their time and their thoughtful consideration of this issue and acknowledge their stated commitments to advancing equity and inclusion in our community. Katie respectfully declined the invitation to meet and Chris did not respond. WARC is committed to continuing an honest open dialogue with the select board and to challenging racism at all levels, including interpersonal racism and systemic racism. To that end, on behalf of WARC, I'm requesting the select board update the public either tonight or at the June 21st, 2021 select board meeting on their response to the statement calling for Chris's resignation or removal from the vice chair position, including the status of a vote on his removal. In addition, WARC requests the board explain how they'll respond to future racist statements or actions should they occur. Thanks again uh, for your continued conversation around this and consideration uh, to support racial equity in our community. And um, we hope to continue to partner with you on this important work. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Um, as you can probably see, Chris, you can see that Chris is not in attendance tonight. I don't know if you can see that from Zoom. Yeah, so Chris, Chris is not here. I think he's at camp, which was what I saw. Okay. Um, so just a comment there. Um, hold on, Tom, real quick. Um, yeah, I think through the conversation, it was an important conversation and understand that there's certain members of the public that are unhappy with the decision that was made. Um, I'm not sure how to proceed personally. Um, and I think that not all of us in the board knew that the statement would be made tonight, but I think it, with Chris's absence, I, I would say that I would suggest that we respond as a board at the next meeting, at the, the 21st. Um, but yeah, I, I understand. I think for me personally, yeah, I sat as the vice chair for a number of years, and I saw it as more of a, a role to run the meetings and to run through the steps of the agenda and try to do the best I could at that position, but I understand that the public has seen the importance of the chair position as a voice to the board. And when those words hurt or hurt our community members, it's a problem. Um, and I, I don't know how to proceed here. Um, I understand your concerns, and I think that potentially we should have really thought about that decision maybe a bit more than we did, but I'm not sure. And I'm interested to hear if the other board wants. You know, the other board members can decide to speak tonight or we can table it till the 21st. But yeah, I understand the public's concern. I couldn't have said it any better than you did, Mark. Uh, I concur with everything. I do think with Chris not being here, I think that discussion should go. And again, since the 21st looks like we're going to be doing um, you know, racial equity and inclusion training, I, you know, that may not be the right, right meeting. We probably should do it the meeting they're at. Right. Yeah, so I'm not sure, Aaron, if you know, later on the agenda, we're going to be discussing the racial equity training that will most likely be the entire 21st meeting that, as far as we've discussed, would not be open mm -hmm. to the public, and we'll discuss the reasons and the legality behind it. Um, Bill can speak to that, but... Um, there might not, I'm not sure if there would be a public session prior to that, but just so you know, that's 
going to be voted on tonight, that most likely that meeting will be in its entirety that training. So, um, Great. I did see that on the agenda. Thanks. Yep. I'll stick around and listen to that discussion too. I'll just add, um, it's the same thing, but just so that it's in public record and so you can hear it from me. Without Chris here, I do feel a little uncomfortable speaking about it. I think it's most fair to have the conversation with him in the room. Um, I've spoken with, you know, members of WARC and um, separately some members of the board. And um, as it was my very first select board meeting, I did not know how to handle the situation when um, Chris was nominated and looking back. Um, I think there's a lot we can learn in terms of training new board members and talking about election, discussing the importance of election to, to positions on the select board um, and how to proceed with voting. So I think it's a really good learning opportunity. Um, and then in terms of the specific issue, I, I definitely would prefer to speak about it when Chris is here as well. So yeah, Aaron, I think that's where we are right now, uh, you know, in terms of what you mentioned, we as a board don't have the ability to remove someone from the board. That's not a power that I understand that we have any control over. The only thing we could potentially do is remove Chris from his position of vice chair. It would require someone to call the question and then a uh, majority of the board. So that would be the only real power we have for Chris to remove himself from the chair position or the board. Those are, as far as I understand, potential things that can happen. We cannot remove a member of the board. So obviously these, we are voted into these positions. So that's another way in the future that anyone can decide to try to change the board or decide someone doesn't deserve to be on the board X, Y, Z. So um, that's how it, that's the procedure that could potentially come in the future. And um, I think we'll push this to an opportunity where Chris is here as well. Um, because I do think that's the fair thing to do. Um, Thanks, Mark. Here, feel free to have any comments back. You know, we're still in the, the public portion of the meeting. Yeah, I think though it it we're not at this point looking for Chris's removal from the board, just um, from the vice chair position as a as a leadership position, and um, you know he does get to then whoever's in the vice chair position then does get to conduct the meetings and. Um, designate how much time different members of the, the public have to speak during any particular issue. Uh, we're real, that's what we're looking for is just the board to really examine whether he's the right person to be in that position and um, just share publicly then what the next steps would be if you choose to take any action. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, anyone else? I think I saw Tom, your hand was up. Yep. We'll My turn. Okay. Um, about a month ago, I had seen the grass growing out in the multi-use area at Hope Davy, and I offered to do some limited mowing. As some of you may or may not know, I have a, a newly formed nonprofit called uh, Friends of Hope Davy Park Incorporated. Um, the bigger issue is about 10 or 12 years ago, I had asked about mowing out at the gazebo with my son because he had to do some community service. And at the time I was told that because of uh, liability policy that private, private citizens could not do um, maintenance or uh, run machinery or run private machinery on town lands. And I was told in a select board meeting the same thing that because of liability policy that private uh, machinery um, cannot be used on town lands. And uh, when I made the offer of being available to mow, I was told that it was best that I keep an arm's length between the organization and the town of Waterbury. Mm -hmm. I was also told that uh, the select board specifically needs to be informed and must approve of any improvements or new developments on town lands. Okay, with that being understood, there was a massive private mowing operation Memorial Day morning at eight o'clock this past Monday. There was four large uh, three zero turns and a large rider and probably in the area of eight weed whackers and trimmers and probably 15 private citizens for 
a good portion of the morning um, taking down the, the fairways out there in the multi-use and the pathways in the multi-use area. So I guess I would like, I'm confused. I would like to know what is true. What is the town liability policy? Because I've been requested to, um, to both uh, have proof of my corporation and also to have private liability insurance for anything that I can do for the town. And I'll be in a position to do quite a bit and ask nothing of the town. That's kind of the, the reason why I formed this. But um, it appears to me that there's a double standard and that the approval process is not, uh, I don't believe there's a protocol for it. And I feel that I was discriminated against both in the previous events of 10, 12 years ago, where I was told, no, you can't privately come on to town lands with machinery. And then uh, a month ago, when I made the same offer and was told, you know, specifically to stay off town lands. So, um, and it also, you know, it said that um, it is, these are Waterbury town lands and that people need specific approval before they take the initiative to do anything on their, you know, on their own, which I have hey, never, Tom, uh, that's not one of my Tom, events. Tom, Tom, can I stop you right there? So I guess the first okay. question is, I'll, I'll ask. I, I'd like to finish, please. I have one more sentence. I'd like to finish, but I do feel that, uh, that there's a double standard and I feel that I was discriminated against uh, in this instance. I might've joined if I was aware, but it wasn't offered. So that's where it stands. Well, Tom, so I think the first thing that's important is to know whether or not Bill or Nick were aware that the mowing occurred. If obviously, the double standard question is, is does this group, were we aware as a town that this mowing was occurring and what happened from there? So I think that's the first question because your comments of saying that you were treated differently, if this might have been someone that showed up with mowers and just did it, you know, so we need to understand that before maybe you should have the feelings of you've been treated differently than somebody else. So I guess my first question would be to Bill, and then I see Nick is on the line. So, you know, happy to hear what Bill has to say, and then Nick, but we might not have the answer tonight, but we can certainly- That's fine. Okay, thanks. Right. I don't have the answer to the second part of the question. Um, so a little history, and I'm not sure what happened with regard to the, uh, you know, bearing mowing situation that Tom just described. But years ago, when the when the center chains golf course, this golf course was established, uh, the select board at that time told the disc golf community that they could use the land at Hope Baby Park, and that they would have to build the facility on their own, and the town wasn't going to spend any money to uh, put anything into that, and they would be allowed to do work on the park. Now that's a long time ago and I'm not trying to take cover and hide under a rock so to speak, but it may be that some of those people are still involved and they've just kind of been going on doing this uh, year in and year out. Steve was here and was involved when the when the disc golf course was first, first established. Now I don't know if you talked to anyone else Tom, but you were the one you reached out to me and I was the one that told you that I didn't think that it was a good idea given your, um, you know, your not-for-profit that you've established uh, trying to help, uh, you know, you, you established this not-for-profit helping out a town a municipal park without having any conversation with anybody in the municipality. Maybe it came up at a rec committee meeting, but it, it never was talked about here. So, um, you know, I talked with you or emailed you back and said, no, I don't think it's a good idea that, that you mow. Uh, I was specifically talking about, uh, you know, the, the parks itself, not the, the disc golf area. Uh, we did work out an arrangement where you wanted to volunteer to do something with the, uh, with the barbecue pit up there. And I, I think I arranged for you to be able to do that. I know that there's been some email exchanges going back and forth about, you know, trying to get that work done. So I don't think anybody's trying to blackball you. So I'm not sure what happened on Memorial Day. This is the first I've heard of it, but Nick is here and, and they know. So I'm, I'll turn it over to him. 
Hey, so uh, yeah, Tom. Tom is um, Tom's right. There was mowing on Monday. Uh, Mark Starwall emailed me a few weeks ago and had mentioned that uh, he was going out there to to um, mow, but on a scaled back level based on conversations that he's had with the with the rec committee and whatnot. Um, I talked to Woody, our public works director, uh, as past practice, and as Sheplek or Bill had just said that the um, um, you know, the, the running stipulation that is uh, that that group was to take care of that area so the town didn't have to invest um, resources into it. Um, we're working, I mean, as you all know, and Tom knows, to, to try to form something new here, um, something more in writing. But for now, um, I, I was aware of the mowing. I didn't know it was going to be X amount of mowers. From the email, it just sounded like it was going to be Mark. Um, to add a little context too, to Tom feeling discriminated, I did apologize to him. Um, when we first started talking about this volunteer effort, um, it, it, it was at some point $200 had come up and between me and the town foreman, we, um, we thought that we were paying for materials or, or somehow paying Tom. It was a miscommunication. And um, so I asked him for, you know, anytime the town, town can't just pay people to work. So I'd asked him for, you know, our standard vendor um, forms or, you know, our contract and liability forms, proof of insurance. Um, after Tom had sent all that, I went to the bookkeeper and she's like, confirm that it's, you know, volunteer or talk or if it's something we're going to be paying for. I confirmed with Tom that it was, it was going to be a volunteer effort. And so therefore I didn't need any of that stuff. And I apologize for that. Explain that to him that it was just a misunderstanding, but um, th that's that's the context I have on the on on that topic. So to make the board members clear on how volunteerism with machinery procedurally should work, obviously you should contact the town offices, but there is a a, a path to allow that. We're saying, but it needs to be with. A representation of insurance and what is that procedure? I mean, I guess I guess my question is, Nick. Obviously, did these did this group have insurance for their equipment? You were aware of this. I mean, I know we're talking about this now. Were you aware that maybe they should have had insurance? What was that procedure? The the insurance procedure is for if we're, the town is paying a vendor to come on. So like when we till the gardens. Um, we, we really should revisit the whole thing. As I said, my, my guess is that the people who are mowing are still operating on uh, an agreement when things were much less formal with a select board, I don't know, that's 15, 20 years ago that the golf course was built. So, you know, that, that they, they basically dealt with that area. It's only, since really last fall when, you know, and I'm not blaming Tom, I'm just, the issue of the multi-use and the conflicts between the disc golfers and other people who want to use that area really just came up last fall. And, and so I think that, I know the rec committee has been working on um, uh, policies and protocols and Nick, uh, are you still there? Oh yeah, you're over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what? Where is the rec committee in terms of um, you know the the process that they've been going to through to address the issues that Tom and Meg and others in the in the community have brought up? That's really the crux of the issue, I think. Yeah, they they um, Frank actually sent an agenda to Carla and I today, but it. It looks like on the agenda they have on it to talk about the the um, the laundry list of of issues or, or problem areas that were identified throughout this process. Um, you know, Frank Frank's pretty um, confident that we can check off a few of the issues, and then um, and then the the language that they're recommending is is still being officially formulated. But there were some small things that we were able to do on the side, like request for a trail use counter. Um, we didn't get it. The state is using both of them right now, but um, there were some small, small steps that they were able to kind of present to, to me. And I've, I've mentioned them to you 
but um, nothing concrete in front of the board yet. They're still working on trying to sort everything out, making sure that they have uh, the, the best language going forward um, for eventual signs and whatnot. But you know, they've been working on it. So. Right. Can I ask a question though? Yeah, yeah. So what, um, Nick, what will the procedure be once there's a policy through the rec committee and rec department, then will it go to the municipal manager? Will we see it as a select board? Like how does it work so that we can stay apprised of what that procedure is? Yeah, so so the rec department is the municipality. So the, the rec okay. committee is separate. They're a volunteer group. Um, they're an advisory board. So um, they they are gonna present their recommendations based on how they see it through the view of recreation in the town of Waterbury. And they're gonna present it to um, theoretically me and select board and the town manager. We're all looped into kind of one. Um, uh, I'll, I go to the meeting, so I'll be able to give input on like if this is feasible or not. Um, but they will eventually bring something to the select board meeting for all of us to, to see. And then from there, staff will go in and implement the changes that um, we can we can do that are approved, you know, um, et cetera. I think the other thing too, you know, Tom has brought a reasonable concern to us. Um, you know, it's probably a good time maybe to revisit the arrangement with the people who are the disc golfers because I think part of the issue that Tom has had and, and others have had is that it seems that the disc golfers have been given a pretty loose leash, so to speak. And there needs to be, <clears throat> there needs to be um, a plan, uh, you know, a, a land use plan, if you will. What, do they, what is the expectation for this property? And while the select board might still choose to ask the disc golf community to <clears throat> pay for and to even do the work that's necessary on the course, it should be work that's approved by us. And, you know, it, it, they shouldn't just be allowed to go out there and say, wow, we want to take these trees down and we want to reboot this here. There should be a, a plan that comes to Nick as the rec director comes so that, you know, Steve, who the planning department was very instrumental, as I said, in the development of the Hope Davy Park, and ultimately, it's a municipal uh, facility, so the select board should be the one uh, uh, putting the final stamp of approval, if you will. So we've got to revisit this whole process, I think. And thank you for bringing it to our attention, Tom. Yeah, Tom, thanks. And uh, I think the other thing, too, is if, if they're not going to formalize themselves and someone within the rec department or committee needs to help with that arrangement. Yeah, that that is one of the, the things they're trying to do is, is get them to kind of formulate a group similar to WADA. Um, and, and there's been progress on it, but there's also been, it's also stalled. You know, members aren't stepping up who have been doing the work and whatnot um, for multiple reasons. It's, it's, there's a lot of pieces to this, but um, yeah. To figure out. I thank you, Tom, for bringing it to our attention. I was unaware of that. Myself. Yeah, I want to say, um, you know, thank you and thank you, Bill. And um, my main concern is for the town is liability and exposure. And it's huge with power tools. It's huge. If someone hacks their leg and goes to the ER, they're not going to talk to their buddy that owns it. They're going to call you, Bill. They're going to be like, my lawyer said this happened on town land. So... These are big issues. It's these aren't to be tossed aside. They need they need policy. So thank you. I appreciate uh, your willingness to hear me out. I agree with Tom. I think maybe this is like a parking lot issue that we need. Not so much even recreation. I think we need to speak about liability issues in general. Because I know when I was chair of the conservation commission, when the reservoir was drained, we went out with weed whackers and chainsaws cutting down brush, you know, before the reservoir was going to be refilled. And that was a little a volunteer activity and no one probably thought anything. So we probably do need to look at what the town's responsibility on any activity is in terms of what our liability coverage is and what people need to do if they are going to volunteer. Or also talk to council and see if there's right. a liability waiver that there's mm -hmm. some kind of path to not 
still allowing the work to be performed, but remove the town's risk. Right. Right? Exactly. So, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, we have to continue to move on, Tom, but we'll, we'll continue. Yeah, no, that's to... fine. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, Alexia, I think you had your hand up. Yes. Hi. Thank you. Um, back to the to the racial equity piece and Chris Vianza's vice chair. Yes. Uh, oh, by the way, I'm speaking as an individual cons uh, constituent. I live in Waterbury. Um, uh, yes. I mean, as far as what to do, um, I think that a warned agenda item, of course, it makes sense. Um, you know, to not do it tonight. Um, but my suggestion, my proposal would be a warned agenda item. Um, on a vote to remove him as vice chair with a roll call in the meeting minutes so that the public knows um, who's voting which way. Um, and the reason I say that is because, um, you know, as you will learn in your training, if you haven't, you know, if, if you haven't, don't already know, it's you either name and dismantle systemic racism or you uphold it. There is no neutrality. There is no in between. And so doing nothing and saying, oh, our mistake, you can vote them out in two years, is upholding systemic racism. Um, you know, it's it's not in the walls, it's in the people that that govern, and that's you, and it's in your decisions. Um, so I would ask for a vote with a roll call. Um, and as you consider that, um, I would, I, you know, and I will say this to you so that you can reflect on it in advance. Um, I'm also happy to state it again when Chris is in the room, um, but this is a position of power. The vice chair is a position of power. Your procedures say so. Um, your procedures are clear that the chair and the vice chair, when standing in for the chair, uh, get to rule on all questions of order or procedure uh, and enforce the rules as required by 1 VSA uh, 312H. Uh, the statutes are clear that it's the chair's um, responsibility to decide how public comment is run. Um, Mark, in a previous meeting, you stated, and it's pretty clear just by watching any meeting, that the chair does talk the most, um, and so the vice chair in, in, in their stead. Um, that's a whole lot of power. Um, and so, you know, a defense or an excuse or a something, it has been proposed on a number of times by a number of select board members that it's not a position of power. And I respectfully disagree. And I think that the law and your own procedures um, are pretty clear um, to that. And then the other thing that I just don't want to get lost in this is that this is a, what you are voting on or what we are asking you to, to take a stand on is not one incident. It's not one thing. It is a pattern of behavior that has happened over and over again, despite the fact that people have reached out to Chris individually and he hasn't responded. And then when we reach out publicly, he plays the victim and acts like nobody has reached out to him individually. Yet again, after the 419, so he made statements, racist statements back in September and then in November and then in January. And then all of you elected him, voted to elect him as vice chair in March. And then when we first brought this issue up on um, at the 419 meeting, he went on a tremendous unprofessional diatribe that was very much directed at a member of the public who was speaking uh, on behalf of an organization and was talking about systemic racism and Chris made it very personal. So not only did he say more racist things at that meeting, but he did not, in my opinion, show conduct um, appropriate for a select board member and certainly not for a leadership position on the select board. So, um, so when you vote, um, please know that it's not only about Chris's pattern of racist and harmful behavior, but it's also your endorsement of it, right? Because when you voted for him, whether it was at, and, and if it was an honest mistake, wonderful, undo it. You can undo it. Um, so that really the, the vote isn't just about his behavior, but your endorsement of his behavior through your vote and through your inaction. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, any other public members wish to speak before we move on to the agenda? Let's see anyone? All right, moving on to select board business. 
mask mandate reopening. So as many people are probably aware, we voted in a mask mandate. I can't remember what date it was. Um, and it's still in place as far as I know. <laughs> and we know that things, we're <laughs> um, as we're all aware, the CDC has come out and said that um, vac fully vaccinated individuals potentially don't need to wear masks. So it's a discussion on whether or not we modify or remove the mandate. And that will let Bill take it from there. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, you really hit the high points uh, there already. Um, the governor. Uh, as you know, issued an executive order um, for COVID uh, way back in, you know, a year ago in, in March, March 13th, 2020. And shortly after that, a couple of months after that, the town actually followed suit and uh, the select board adopted a mask mandate in the town of Waterbury which applies to businesses as well as public facilities and public institutions. Um, we've never uh, we've never gone out to enforce this rule, but most businesses in the community still have signs up. The signs signage is beginning to change a little bit. That's reflecting a little bit more of what the governor has said. So um, on the 15th of May, uh, the governor amended his executive order and this order will stay in effect until June 15th, unless he updates it earlier. It could be tomorrow or uh, uh, as early as tomorrow that he, he makes a different uh, ruling. But right now it says mask use Section 7F of the amended and restated executive order is hereby amended in its entirety to read as follows. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. But in effect, fully vaccinated people affected immediately, this is May 15th, can resume activities without wearing a face covering over nose and mouth or physically distancing except where required by federal, state, or local rules and regulations. For the purpose of this section, fully vaccinated people uh, are defined as those who have received the second dose and two weeks have passed since that second dose of the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine, or if they've received the single dose Johnson & Johnson vaccine after two weeks of that. Um, inside, unvaccinated people are still supposed to wear masks. Outside, unvaccinated people are not required to wear uh, masks when they're in outdoor public spaces, provided that they don't have close contact or sustained uh, contact with uh, people from outside their household. So uh, there has been a lot of questions asked of me and asked of staff, uh, some from people here in the building, some from people in the community. And I would suggest that it might be timely for the select board to, to lift its mask mandate now uh, and just uh, make a motion to, uh, to withdraw the local ordinance dealing with masks and simply state that people are asked to follow the governor's, uh, the state's directive. And, uh, you know, if that's the case, um, if if people here have been fully vaccinated, you can take your masks off now, uh, and you don't have to wear them. So I'll stop there and see if you have any questions um, from anyone, public, staff, select board members. How do you feel about that? You know, I agree with everything you said, Bill. The only thing I would change is that our mask mandate goes when the uh, you know, emergency order is is lifted, which is probably going to be in a couple of days. But I'd say the two should be concurrent, and we could make a motion tonight that has it that it, it gets lifted when the state of emergency is ended. You're going to have to wear a mask here tonight. Any other thoughts? 
So even though the state's emergency order has been amended to say that fully vaccinated people don't have to wear masks now, you want to make us wear masks until the state of emergency is completely canceled? Well, I think that's going to happen, you know, again, based upon the number of vaccines, that's almost imminent. And I always say, why have this interim step and kind of, you know, just do it when, you know, we're going to have in a couple of days. But the interim step has been instituted by the state. I know, but. Could we put both in whatever we pass? Could it include that we'd like to lift the mask mandate in accordance with what the state mandate is and also when the state mandate changes, our municipal mandate will follow suit so that we don't have to do this again. Is that, is that clear? Again. We would have to do it again. Yeah, the right. only thing we put in place was the mask mandate as far as I understand. So right. if we remove the mandate, we're following state rules. Just following state rules, so we don't have to do a second step. Right. Okay. Yeah. So Mike, you don't want to do it now in accordance with what the state mandate is or state guidance is? I just thought it would be cleaner to have it when it's the state of emergency is going to be done. You know, as a matter of fact, the governor said he will go on the air. I know his conference is tomorrow, mm -hmm. but we may not get 4,000 vaccines by tomorrow. So it's probably going to be by the end of this week. You know, I think even sooner. Would changing it um, still allow businesses to create their own policies based on their staff and well, choices? No, I mean, right now we have a mandate. It's a local decision by the local board. I don't I don't have the motion that was made, sure. but we're not enforcing it. Right. People are beginning to to relax their standards, so to speak, and they're complying with what the governor has said. Uh, but we have a mandate that says you need to wear a mask mm -hmm. in public place. So if we don't change anything, that stays and because you're the body that makes the rules, I think it would be very inappropriate, at least in this building, if we ignored the fact that you left the mask mandate in place. So. Sure. I, I sorry. My question wasn't clear then. If we do make a change now, could a local business still encourage um, yes. masks in their business yes. until? Okay, so that's the, what the executive order goes on. It says businesses. Gotcha. Not-for-profits and government entities shall continue to implement measures notifying unvaccinated customers and clients to wear a mask. Um, and then, you know, the legislative body of each municipality may enact more strict local requirements regarding mask use than those set forth herein. Businesses may also ask more, enact more strict requirements. Perfect, requirements. thank you. So That's awesome. if a business feels strongly that they want their customers to wear masks, they can, they okay. can still demand that, just like they can demand fusion. So. <laughs> yeah, like I understand your idea, but I think that there's a there's also an important thing to show as leaders that we're confident in the science and that we're on a good path towards going out of this pandemic that we've seen in the short this pandemic. You know, so it's like mm -hmm. I don't I don't think we should extend it beyond tonight personally. I think that we should remove it and move on to the state. I think when we did it initially, it was because we didn't, or at least I, but I think we as a board also felt like the state wasn't moving fast enough towards masks. But I think now we have a mandate in place that is behind where we are as a state. And I think that we're, in a, we're luckily number one, I think right now in vaccination. And it's been proven as a very effective way to, um, work against this virus. So I think it would be important as a select board to make decisions tonight to say, you know, we're, I would take the mandate away. I have no problem with that. I was just yeah. looking at the, sure. the optics of, you know, where we're having a statewide thing and we're just, you know, it, sure. I thought it would be like a two, it's a two step process, but I guess we can do that ahead of time. And then the I'm rest saying, of well, I don't think we're doing we're it ahead of time. Different. We're doing it in, what we want in step with this with the, the this this has been the rule since guidance. may 15th that's right we're not and saying so that we're through, you should not. still can i believe the cdc rules that you should say on the state rules if you're unvaccinated you should continue to be wearing a mask so this is right. removing a mandate that is saying that any person no matter who you are in town should be continually wearing masks so i think that the 
the removal is saying that we're moving the mandate, but now it defaults to the state and federal rules surrounding this. So it's yeah. it's not saying we're saying water rates mask free. We're saying vaccinated people that are fully vaccinated the full time after your two weeks that you can now remove your mask following these guidelines that the state is and that's following federal guidelines. So I think that's a very important part of this conversation. I have no problem with that. Do you? Um, so I'll entertain a motion. Um, did everyone, did anyone get what Bill, Bill kind of laid out the motion? That, that uh, we will comply with the governor's executive order and fully vaccinated people um, are not required to stay in Washington. So moved. Second. Thank you, guys. All right. Been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> oh. All right. No, Skip can come to the meeting on Wednesday. <laughs> I think that's a really Thank you, that's, a, that's a pretty big moment for Waterbury. It sure is. Thanks. Um, the second part of that question was about uh, reopening. Uh, so mask mandate slash reopening. Um, the municipal offices have been closed to the public except by appointment for a long time now. And um, we've been talking and you know we have to kind of plan things and some staff have been working from home and uh, I expect that will continue. So, um, uh, three weeks or so ago, we had a staff meeting, and at the time, the governor was suggesting that it was going to be July 4th when things kind of fully open. So we kind of plugged in, I think it was what, July 12th? July 12th. We, were, we were looking to reopen the building, uh, our side of the building completely. The, the library will begin to have uh, in-person uh, patronage allowed sooner, but um, the select board doesn't have to take any action, but if you have concerns about our opening on July 12th or waiting until July 12th to reopen, we can talk about it now. Um, I think you were talking about continuing uh, appointments for land records after that or no? I am strongly considering requiring appointments for title searchers and lawyers. We only have one public terminal. I don't anticipate that we would have two or three people in at once, but the appointment system has been working really well. We've been fitting everybody in appointments three days a week. So. Has there been any pushback about the appointment system? None. That's good. No, and I think I think a lot of them actually find it more convenient. Mm -hmm. Yes. They don't come and in, they can't. They don't come it's something we do during COVID that we never did before was email tax bills and Worcester cards and fees and, and hope they pay us, which I don't think that's a huge success when we're receiving payment, but we're talking a couple hundred dollars. So mm -hmm. it's worked. But for planning and zoning and and recreation and things like that, we plan to basically open open the building. Uh, and I think for our, us logistically, if we can just count on kind of the 12th, as we've been talking about internally, that will be helpful for us. And so that means this space would then be available for public It's meetings. already available. For I know it has been for some meetings. Um, we allowed, um, well, it was, we told people we have to get into June. So the cemetery commission has met here last week. Uh, John Malter has got a composting um, workshop that's scheduled here for I don't know, this weekend or next weekend. I'm not sure which, but yeah, we we will start to reopen uh, taking reservations for the spaces. Great. Any other <clears throat> so you don't need to take any action here. Yeah. It's just a kind of update. Concern questions on that. Um, <clears throat> what was item A is B plus full permit for NQID on July 10th. Then there was uh, some detail that came up. 
Right. So um, Dan McKibben is here. Dan is the president of the Rotary Club. Um, and the Rotary Club is going to be doing uh, uh, NQIV. Typically, it's always been the last Saturday in June, you know, the Saturday before the 4th. But because, as I was just suggesting, the governor was saying things weren't going to get back to normal and not be fully open to the public until after the July 4th holiday, uh, Rotary, in conjunction with the town, uh, pushed off the date to July 10th. And I think logistically, because they've already started to plan everything, that nobody wants to move it back to June now. So uh, there will be an event at Rusty Parker Park, uh, and uh, they need a festival permit for that. When I sent this memo out on uh, Friday, we had <coughs> received a, a plan for how they were going to segregate the, uh, the park for the purposes of selling beer. And I don't know if you've got that, Charlie. Okay, first one. Yeah, so we're going to do what we did two years ago and fence the, most of Rusty Parker Park, uh, except right across behind the monuments uh, close to Main Street. We'll have a fence across the park there. We're going to have two entrances, one in the corner closest to Park Row and Main Street on that path, another gate directly behind the pump house. Uh, it's the same configuration we used two years ago that provided um, perfect control for us of who's coming in and out and making sure, you know, no external beverages come in and no, no beer goes out. We are going to have a small number of food and multi-vendors. They're going to be along um, Park Street and Park Row, uh, contained within the fence. So that, you know, we'll let them come in uh, into mid, uh, early afternoon on Saturday, and then we'll put the fence around them. And the We'll be, we'll be selling beer only. Uh, nobody else will be selling any alcoholic beverages there. Who's the actual carrier of the liquor license? Um, Tom Badowski has filled in the paperwork uh, as a member of the Rotary. Are you serving? I thought you have to be licensed like a... Uh... Does there have to be a liquor license connected to this, like a theater or bar or restaurant? Can you just do an event with beer? But how does the sale of beer to them get to go to the grocery store and buy it? I guess I'm just trying to figure out. I've done large events like this, and I know that it can be very difficult to just manage the crowd. And I'd imagine that you're going to have this roaring 20s back to an outdoor event. So I would just make sure that. I was just wondering who it might be because I just want to make sure that they're aware of how chaotic this could get and how you control it. And I know that certain sizes require double fencing and there's quite a bit to this. And then I guess next question would be just liability and how does that work on I mean, these? Back to our other question on our other thing, just on town land, beer event. Obviously, there's dram shop law. I don't. I really thought about it until thinking that this could be actually crazy busy. <laughs> Which is a good thing, but just making sure that there's a plan to be busy. I'm not an expert on the, the state liquor laws, but I know we're following the same protocol we've used at NQID for many years, where we, um, Tom is our expert on the, the state liquor laws and gets trained and trains all of our servers you know, our servers, servers are not, you know, we're checking IDs and everyone, uh, our servers are not drinking, you know, and, you know, we're very strict about following the guidelines and making sure we're not serving inebriated people. We, we have not had any crowd control issues in prior years at NQID. Um, it may, you know, we're hoping for some festivity this year, but we're also not promoting the event as widely as we have in the past. You know, in the past, we've aimed to get cast as wide a net as we can. This year, we're trying to keep it local and, you know, we're not doing a lot of advertising. I think, Mark, that, and I, I, you know, Carla deals with the liquor licenses and the select board, and I'm not an expert on it at all, but I believe this 
festival permit as described is a way that organizations like the Rotary Club can get a liquor license to do this directly. So they don't one day liquor license. Yeah, that they don't need to have, uh, you know, uh, I mean, we'll, we'll make sure that's sure, the sure, case, sure. but uh, when when Rotary has done this in the past, I think it's I think it's the direct the license is direct to them. Okay. Um, and so the question to us is the approval of the permit. Correct. Right. And any other board members have any questions for the event? So the notes that you sent said that the application was not yet complete pending this, but does this make it so now you have a complete application and what we're approving is is fully. Yeah. yeah, I think you can you can uh, still um, make a motion to grant the permit condition on all the I's being dotted and T's being crossed. We'll make sure that, the state. Yeah, we'll make sure with the Department of Liquor Control that we can issue this directly to them. And I believe we can. So and there's an assumption they're gonna lift the other thing that we're going to allow an event large right now because we hopefully that goes away so right. do we have to put that comment in the motion even though we're pretty sure it's going to go this week that yeah like, we'd I mean, be approving a permit out for something that technically isn't allowed right now. I, I think you can that can be part of the conditions okay. you know if it meets uh state protocols and the liquor license is you know what we're saying issued yeah. in accordance with the yeah. rules we have studied the guide state guidelines very meticulously and you know, we're all relieved that things are we're opening up faster than expected but that's the primary reason we moved from uh june and was to be in step four so you know we didn't have to have responsibility for tracking who was vaccinated and who isn't uh, High, as we all know, very high probability we will be out of all controls by July 10th. Uh, I will, just a question. How does the parade part of this, you know, because I assume cause if, if we have everything being lifted, the parade can go on just the way it has. So it is going on mm -hmm. at 4 o'clock. Right, right. Yeah. This isn't for the parade. This is right. This is the, the park. Part, the the, park what we're asking, what you're being asked to act on tonight, is the festival permit the festival. to okay. allow the uh, sale of alcohol. They've already reserved the park. The park is owned by the Edward right. Park Utility District. They've already reserved the park through through that process. So uh, it's just the festival permit that you have. I guess I look at the festival and the parade all one kind of thing. Yeah. I'll make a motion to approve the festival uh, permit for the not quite independence parade. They parade on July, July the 10th, um, subject to lifting of the uh, the governor's, the governor's yeah. protocol. Protocol. governor's protocol. Okay. Uh, we didn't include that beer sales condition as well, which we wanted to put in that motion. Okay. Part of Just the like permit. Yeah, the festival permit is yeah. the, the, the grand permit. permit. Is the beer permit so. okay. um, I guess I had one quick question for additional discussion. Are you bringing in a third party security company for this, or are you planning on doing all the security yourself? As it stands right now, we've got Bell's help and, and Lieutenant White's help. Both of the state troopers assigned to Waterbury are going to be on duty all day. Um, do not think we need additional security uh, around the park. The primary concerns are traffic management during the parade and traffic around the release from the fireworks. Um, but having them on duty you know, near or in the village, uh, if there is any issues, um, is a good thing. Um, but we, you know, since we stopped having a carnival, it was the last time I think we really needed any security on site. Um, and that was a number of years ago. Are you going to have anybody from the sheriff's office or anything to help with traffic management? We are, we've been debating that today. We've got a meeting on Wednesday to discuss that further. Um, but I would, you know, appreciate maybe offline your thoughts on that bill, uh, if we should have additional security or, or just rely upon the 
state police? Yeah, well, I mean, you can do it either way, but the, of course, what you've got to be able to do is have enough people that are stopping traffic at all the various intersections and the two state troopers aren't going to be able to do that. So you're going to have to be able to, you know, keep traffic from coming off of Stowe Street, keep traffic from coming through the roundabout, Winooski Street, the other end of Main Street. So um, I know in the past you've used sheriff's departments to help with that, but uh, I'm sure you've taken all that into consideration. The, so our, the Rotary is working closely with the fire department on the logistics for the parade, uh, but I will make sure that we have a staffing plan to cover. You know, my thinking was state police at each end of Main Street, like at the, the traffic circle and down by Batchelder Street, um, but we'll confirm exactly control the traffic at each intersection. Okay. Just a point of order. We should have probably had a second before. We did get a second. Oh, yeah. I didn't hear the second. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, all right. Next up is special event permit for the antique car show, which is um, a car show that came to us for Stowe that takes place in Forest Field. Yes, sir. And I think there's someone here. You want to come up to the table and introduce yourself? And... My name is Robert Chase, and I'm the uh, co chair of the uh, Vermont Antique and Classic Car Show. Welcome. Um, Mr. Chase is very thorough. He sent me uh, that same manila, well, not that same manila envelope, but he sent me a manila envelope like that that has uh, everything in it that we could ever think to ask for. Uh, I did include uh, just two uh, or three pages in the packet I sent to you, which describes the parade route the road closures and, and the little map. But if you want to um, take a few minutes to talk to us about your plans, that's great. Well, there, there's a couple things. In the um, Send three that way and three that way. Um, and relative to your earlier discussion about COVID things, you flip the silver on the very back, you'll see near the bottom that we have uh, stated on there whatever COVID things are in uh, effect at the time of the show will go away. Uh, the other thing is we'd like to change the location of the street dance. Previous years, we've had it down at the train station, which we thought was going to be a wonderful place and, and everything, and it was okay. It was kind of the atomic train station with the cars out front and, and all that. But realistically, it's a long ways from the center of Waterbury, it's in the sort of nightlife of Waterbury, so to speak. So we propose to change that up onto Stowe Street, and I believe you've had other events on Stowe Street, uh, your arts festival and so forth. And <clears throat> WDEV is really the sponsor of the street dance and takes care of all that. They're really excited to do that and have that on Stowe Street. So we proposing to close off Stowe Street from uh, Main Street, kind of up over the driveway, I think it's Union Street, right? Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, park some cars alongside of the street and have the, the street dance there. That, ends it up so if people want to go get a bite to eat or want to go have a drink or whatever, 
because we don't have any uh, alcohol. We don't sell any alcohol or anything in, in our event. So that allows that all to happen right there on, on site. So, so this is different than what you sent to me, right? No, it is not different. There um, is a piece on So it's here. for the street dance, you want to close Park Row, South Main Street intersection, stopping traffic from traveling through Park Row, but will there's provide a, access to the center of the parking lot. No, there's an update to that. I think I put, um, how many cars were there? I don't mind if it's an update, it's just, it's not anything that I saw. You're trying to make it, because I've been to the car show many, many a time, and it's making it much more like what it was in Stowe when they closed off the main street and had yeah. you know all, all the cars. And I think that's actually a much better idea. Um, okay, so let, me, let me see what I can find. Stop the to you have, I've got a separate page here that I denoted on the front because this is something that kind of came along here. You should have a copy of this. Well, I've, I've got this and I've got this. I, I don't mind. I mean, we, we can ship you. And, and I didn't send you this? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, well, I didn't find it. It might be in my packet, but I thought- Yeah, it was, it was a little different thing. It was basically a release off of the request to moving the dance. I mean, well, I, I apologize because this was uh, kind of an update as, as everything uh, happened. Yeah. And we'd really like to change that. WDEV is very excited about that. To change it, it would really work better. So your parade route goes. The parade route stays the same. Stays the same. Okay. Um, I mean, and uh, notice in there, there is a, we had reserved um, Krusty Parker Park and everything in anticipation for having something there. Right. So that's all on the books, that, you know, that uh, to use Rotarian Place. And uh, I have permission uh, from Levi Weiss and Waterbury to use the porch on the train station to announce for the parade and so forth. So those things are that, that's fine. And again, I don't have any problem. Um, just for the select board's benefit, um, and I'm not asking you not to grant permission to the uh, using Stowe Street for the street dance. It, I think it makes a lot of sense for the reasons you just described. And it gets people a lot closer to the business uh, uh, area. <clears throat> but the festival permits, the ordinance that we have that talks about these permits, uh, suggests the select board needs to take into consideration how many of these things are going on. And so, also on tonight's agenda, you, the next item I think is WDEV looking to close the street for their uh, 90th anniversary. And then, as Mr. Chase suggested, the uh, RW is going to be having um, its Arts Fest later in the summer uh, this year. It's uh, September, I guess. What's the date of the car show? August 12th, 14. 14. What's the date of the WDV? June. Uh, July. July 7th. 7th. On the um, notes you sent out, it says June, just as a. But okay. I think July. <laughs> yeah. How many of these happen generally each year? I know of Arts Fest and then generally. Typically one. that's yeah. typically that's been it is the Arts Fest. Um, so and, and again, I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't approve it. It's just you know, and I, I think it can generate uh, business. I think um, I think it's a big plus for the community, especially, you know, I know I have had a car in in the show and the first year when they had it in Waterbury, but they still have the street dance in Stowe. And I said, that's just really bad because you're going to have the parade at three, four o'clock in the afternoon and people are going to be done and they're not going to want to you know, come back to Waterbury. So yeah, we didn't have it in Stowe the first year. We, right. was, I mean, when it, 
But there was a gap. A long there was gap. there was a time when they sort of still sort of thought that we were going to do that, but we never had right. really. If when we made the move to Waterbury, we made the move to Waterbury. You know that. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a huge generator of income. Have you we know. ever had any complaints from the businesses on Stowe Street about like closures like that in the past? No, because like I said, there's I'd imagine the things that you just yeah. one. Yeah. So I just wanted. And then I was asking how many cars are in the dance, and do you think you need to do the entire drive bridge, or could you go from Main Street to where whatever? Uh, yeah, so I know what events do that, and then some events take the whole bridge. Obviously, the construction going over the bridge, but it does take out a route. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if you think you need the entire bridge because of the amount of cars. Kind of, because I I was envisioning that we might use a little bit of the bidwell to park stuff in the that first. Little bit of the, it goes back to a parking area, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, yeah, I think that's well. important though because that is public municipal parking as well. So then we're are we saying that we're going to be moving that part of Bidwell to I don't know, it's just some trying to so that wouldn't be able to be event parking if it's being used as well. Are you saying now you want you want Stowe Street over the dry bridge to Union and then down Bidwell to basically. Uh, slippery cafe or continue on but like no I don't want to continue way along I mean just and, and this is sort of a, a working sure. motion so um, I, I think it would be disruptive to have cars come up over the bridge and suddenly eat you know we can't really go here and try to cram down uh, well I think it would be easier to stop it on the uh, northern side of the bridge. I mean, most locals know how to work around it. I just didn't know if we wanted to take it all the way if you didn't need the space. So if you don't need the space, we're saying just those streets, but you also want some of Bidwell or none of Bidwell? It'd be nice to have a little bit of it, I think, but basically the parking spaces that bump into those three emporium. The other side is private, correct? Yeah, it's rather so that's an important thing too yeah, is right. that there's private parking spaces for the property and your department parking Department spaces. residential. So that's not all ours. So I don't I'm not totally comfortable with doing down Bidwell if all of a sudden now someone locally can't park at their apartment. I don't know how to navigate that. Unless we got approval. If we knew before tonight maybe we could get approval you I mean I, I guess if if I don't know. You know, we're we're going. To, you want to close off the well? I'd rather not see the traffic come up over the sure, sure, sure. I think we can do that in this meeting, going down any of Bidwell and closing it and continuing it for your event, which I know we uh, even maybe the Arts Fest does. The Arts, Arts Fest, Fest does, but, does, but, I, I but they are, must arrange something with. Yeah. I, I don't know. But I, and if that's going to interfere with people, that's fine. Yeah. You know, if if you don't want to go down there, but, all right, that's cool. Prove that also with like as long as the. Property owners don't have a problem with it as well. We can add a caveat. You know, and I'm, we're not trying to sure. step on yeah. people down here. Yeah, to get it. And one of the reasons for moving from down near the train station, there's kind of a large uh, residential area just south of the train station there. And I know that. Um, the first year we had it there, there was some people there that were a little upset with the noise level or the, not necessarily, not that it was real loud, but just, it, it was kind of encroaching on the residential area, I guess is, is what I'm saying. And by moving it up into town, we felt we could kind of alleviate a lot of that. Sorry, what are the hours for this? What would be the hours for the closure and what are the hours for the event? Oh, and six to ten. Six to ten. Who, when the closure happens, what responsibility do we have as a municipality to set up any of that closure, or is it on the event? Yeah, we typically will send the, you know, some couple members of the highway crew to put the barricades <coughs> up and stuff like that, and, 
and arrange to take them down. That, that's not a problem. We can. We How can do you do that if it's at six? When are we actually doing a closure? Because then people are parked on that street. I don't know. How does that work? Well, and usually also a lot of the participants are parking there because they usually and they don't park them like no, normal. I get that way. because they could control that once the barricades are up. But if there's somebody parked on it, shopping, or shopping, and yeah. gets right. gets locked. I guess in. where does the closure occur? Does the closure occur at five a.m. and people can get out but can't come back? I don't I don't know how we, how that logistics yeah. work. It just is a, a thing in uh, install. One of the things that they have done is. Uh, they would have, in, in their case, they have a municipal police force and people don't, but uh, you could even have some of the road crew put out some sort of little thing. Uh, this will be closed off from mm -hmm. X hour to Sign whatever, to the and the, uh, some cones or something like that. Yeah, I mean, we would, I think, would work with revitalizing Waterbury to try to let the business community know and to get the word out that the street's going to be closed at, you know, from six to whatever, um, try to be off of Stowe Street by five o'clock or something like that. We'll get to not going too far. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, any other questions from the board? I think the other thing maybe we should quickly discuss is because of the next agenda item and knowing that there's another event on 9-11, does anyone have a problem with, you know, it's basically one a month, mm -hmm. right? Mid month. I think they're fun, but I know that some people might. And if any, I don't know if we try it and see if the business or the general public says, how dare you did that three times? Or they're like, thank you for doing it three times. And yeah. <laughs> I have a feeling most people are yeah, pretty yeah. excited with just coming out and being able to do right. an outdoor right. event. I think, so, yeah, community events for people who are yeah, looking yeah. for something for the whole family, sure. so not just one target audience. Yeah, yeah, to me, and just the economic vitality and coming off of a pandemic, I think it's a really positive thing for the community. Especially this event, I think the timing will encourage people to patronize the businesses and like exactly. Like now, are cars going in and out during the dance, or you set up the cars and the dance happens? Oh, the cars all leave at the same time. We like to leave the cars there and not let them move in and out. Right, they can't. Uh, it's you always have one or two that somebody. <laughs> got to get out not only knows what reason but basically you come to park at the dance with your antique car and and how we have done that is you have to have a number a registration number from the show you can't just show up with a antique car and, and park there you've got to be a registered show car registration and then then you park on the street and you stay there for the event. And uh, as the event gets like nine to ten, you're going to have a few that are going to leave. You know. Yeah. Uh, but your you know, group will help manage that car to get out safely. We would um, probably like a, a little help and a recommendation. I don't know whether uh, a Rotary Club. I think revitalizing Waterbury doesn't have enough people. Um, but um, how did you how did you do personnel in the past for these events? Who are who is the who are the other? Revitalize and Waterbury took care of it fully for a couple of years, and I talked to Karen Nevin. I'm not sure that she has enough people to do that. We have some of our people, but I would say that we would. You know, or if you have another organization or a suggestion, I would certainly reach out to them for mm -hmm. some extra help. You're really the help is just to maybe navigate a car going in and out from time to time, but you're not, there's no other part to this. There's no fencing, food, yeah, alcohol. Right, so. You're really just managing, helping people cross the street and stuff like that. Is that, is that the help? No, the help is just in, in maybe parking some of the cars and, and okay. getting stuff in there. Yeah, we don't need help for the rest of it. I've thing. already made arrangements for uh, a police officer. Okay. We, we've hired uh, one of the Loyal County uh, Sheriff's Department uh, personnel to be on site. 
So, and that's included in your packet. Yeah, and I think most of the time, obviously, we, we hope that the event coordinators can find the help that they need, but if we can help put you in touch with groups in the area, we're happy to do it. It doesn't sound like you're going to need a ton of people in this, and I have a feeling there are people standing there with their cars will also help you know, get another car out there. I'm not yeah, sure hey, I, about that. Mm -hmm. I think we can, okay. you know, make this work. Okay. And uh, there will be another event in August, uh, weekend of the 28th, Friday night, the 27th. There'll be a concert and a documentary shown during the intermission. Saturday is the 10th anniversary of Irene, and RW is planning a bunch of stuff. Water Barry Arts will be unveiling. Where is that Friday. supposed to take place? Um, I don't know all of what RW has planned for the weekend, but it's supposed to go from Friday to Sunday. I just know that sometime on Saturday, Water Barry Arts will be unveiling uh, the Phoenix. Um, but my understanding is there will be uh, the documentary will be shown here on Saturday on the loop. So there's a bunch of things that they've been talking about. I don't know what all their plans are, but but that means you've got two events in August. Sure, but I think our more conversation around this number of events is the number of times Stowe Street gets closed. So right now we don't know RW would be asking for the closure of Stowe Street for that event. So I, unless I they come and ask us, and at this point I have a feeling they already have another event coming up in uh, on 9-11. So yeah. if they can find space that's not closing down Stowe Street or we can discuss it, but they haven't put in that request. So I think- It's a town-wide thing. The state will be doing tours. Uh, the Historical Society will be doing walking tours that's all on Saturday. Yep. So I don't think anything will be closed down specifically. But it is they would have to ask us anyways to do a road closure. So yeah. Um we'll keep an eye out for it, but thanks for letting us know if the event is coming. Um okay. Any other questions on the anti car show permit? Any concerns from the town? Are you fine with this change? Bill, in terms of the closure, I think we can manage that. I think we can work it out. Anyone want to make a motion or any other questions? Uh, I can make the motion. Um, moving to approve the event as requested, but amending the location of the dance, street dance to uh, Stow Street. Is that all you need to ask? Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Um, so we approved Stowe Street and the same, and the event. same event. Okay. Yeah, great. Um, oh, don't add anything else. <laughs> 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 That's a good one. <laughs> the approval page of the uh, permit. Now, I when can I get a copy of that, that it has been approved? Because I would like to take that approved copy to uh, the state for the state permit, which I haven't received yet. Is that something you send in the mail to me? Yeah, I can do that. Okay. If I could get a, a, a copy of that, that would be. You want it mailed or emailed? Either way. Okay. Whichever works for you. All right. Well. And I I apologize that I didn't put that. I put an update thing in there and everything. Oh, look again. It may be in there, but I I read. I thought I read the whole packet. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Thank you for coming in tonight and being in person. Okay. Yeah. And thank you very much. Thank when you. I send it to you, uh, I may put some contact information from some people from the Rotary Club. They may be willing to Perfect. help you. Perfect. You can reach out to them. I, I think that uh, we could use a little help, kind of 
getting some cars in and so forth and situated and yeah. so that uh, it just goes a little smoother. Okay. When we were in uh, Stowe, uh, the Stowe Vibrancy Group did that thing for us uh, and, and parked a lot of the cars. And as a sidebar, they uh, petitioned the <coughs> town separately and they had like uh, several food tents and uh, alcohol things and, and everything else. But that's something they did on their own and did the, uh, and helped us with the, with the parking. Yeah, I would continue to engage with RW. I think it would be a good continued partner on this event and help it grow as, as it does in one I mean, uh, where would you be planning on putting the stage? Because I know with the with the logistics, I know the way the stove event, you know, everyone's, you know, kind of parked, not catty cornered, and the stage is kind of set back. Waterbury is a little more tight. I'm just I, what I've envisioned is that WDEB will probably want to run right out something of right out of their studio. Yeah. And um, set the stage maybe we, right quite frankly there. haven't figured exactly where it will be because there was no need to really figure it if you know you didn't approve it. We could let you folks figure that out. Yeah. So, okay. Thank you very much. Well I'm I'm sure we can figure it out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Just that and hopefully it will bring some business. <laughs> and we'll all be happy. Well, thank yeah. you. I'm just a heads up, we are running a little behind, so um, we are moving on now to WDEV request for special event permit July 17th. Is there anyone here to represent? No. <laughs> no, there's no one here. Okay. Um, so this is a pretty straightforward request as well. They would like the road closed from 7 o'clock to 2 o'clock on uh, July 16th. I mean, July 17th, I'm sorry, which is a Saturday. Um, From 1 now? 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. And uh, it's their 90th anniversary on the 16th. Uh, they'd like the celebration uh, on the 17th. Uh, they'll broadcast their Saturday morning uh, regular features there um, during the morning and early afternoon hours. They will be working, I think, with local restaurants to try to find, you know, um, food and, and things like that. Um, again, I think this is something that will help easy to, to organize from our perspective. Um, just work with the Public Works Department to, to get the road blockaded at the right time. Um, it seems like a reasonable request to me. So. Any questions from the board for well, state state police coverage for that too? Well, we have state police right, coverage. But um, you might need more. Besides, I think that's going to attract more people. Than um. Well, it may attract people. I'm not sure it's going to attract people that need police force. Yeah. Right. <laughs> no, I, it's not going to be a drug kind of thing. Right. All right, uh, make a motion if there are any additional questions. I make a motion to approve the request uh, to close Stowe Street for the WDEV um, 90th um, anniversary event. Sure. Sorry, Sorry. Uh, quick question Is it, are they also going to do the bridge or is it to the, the what's their closure space? Um, we haven't worked that out yet. Um, they the just say bridge. from the drive bridge right. to Main Street, yeah, but I can <laughs> talk to them. It may be something we can please put it on there. Okay. Okay. Uh, second. Discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, moving on. Blush Hill Paving Plan. Okay. Yeah, this, we talked about this uh, meeting with two ago. Uh, Danny forwarded to me. Uh, I can't remember who it was. Jimmy Chan. So uh, Jimmy Jimmy Chan okay. sent an email to all the select board members, not to me, about this uh, Blush Hill painting that we talked about 
a few years or so ago. And uh, Danny forwarded me to make sure I had seen it. Um, my recommendation after talking to Bill Woodruff is to do exactly what we said we were going to do at the last meeting, which was uh, reclaim Blush Hill all, in the, all at once, all the way to the end of the pavement, even though from um, somewhere, I'm not sure if we'll go right up to the culvert or we'll stop at, at um, Lonesome Trail, but we won't pave that last section this year. Um, they express concerns about mud and dust uh, and rough roads. Um, from our perspective, um, you know, it costs a lot of money to send the milling machine up there and to have to send it a second year in a row just to mill a, a short um, uh, stretch of roadway doesn't make sense. And as far as, you know, the, the conditions of the road, this isn't going to be a standard gravel road where we're going to bring in new, you know, three quarter inch stone and crushed gravel uh, and turn it into like Ripley Road or Perry Hill Road. It's it's going to be the reclaimed asphalt uh, that will grade out and add chloride to and, and pack it. Uh, a few years ago, we decided to, to remove the pavement on Little River Road from uh, route two to where that pavement ended, and we did that there. Uh, and you know, we never repaved that road. So, from my perspective, uh, you know, we heard from you know, that one um, that one person. So, uh, I don't think it's a I don't think it's a terrible hardship to go from um, sometime mid summer this year until uh, uh, next year. And, did you um, have any contact with the Chinese after that email? Okay. Any concern with the plan? I think it sounds yeah. reasonable and I understand the military operation concern and thoughts. I understand the people's yeah, concerns, sure. but I think it's mm -hmm. just, I think what we're doing is a reasonable proposal at a reasonable reasonable cost to the taxpayer. And I don't think it's going to create a lot of extra, you know, headaches to, to the residents. Do we we don't need to vote? Okay. Um non discuss equity training schedule both sent out a uh, pretty detailed explanation on the proposed training and budget and the support for the yes. Yeah, pretty close estimate. Uh, the only the only variable will be how much the uh, overnight accommodations cost, but it's going to be right around that fourteen hundred dollars. Um, you know, I, I did spend um, a couple of weeks going back and forth with Mary uh, Gannon, just really to understand exactly what she was proposing. Initially, when I asked the question, she said. I said, well, you know, does the does the two hundred dollars an hour include your travel time or not? Are we paying that for travel? And she said yes. So I came up with a whole estimate and sent it back to her. And I said, okay, this is what I think it will cost. And she said, oh no, no it won't cost that much. Mm -hmm. I only charge half price for when I'm on the road. So it got me just so anyway. Um, I sent the uh, proposal or statement of purpose for conceptual framework and the like. And um, I need to get back with her. She's uh, scheduled us for the 21st right now. Um, she's agreed that the estimated $1,400 cost is right in, in the close ballpark. So um, you need to do two things. One, you need to make a motion to to authorize the expenditure and do the training. And then secondarily, you have to decide when you want the training. And as I indicated in the email, um, you know, if we I'm I would suggest that we do it, uh, that we warn the select board meeting that night uh, as a select board training only, that there'll be no other business conducted during that meeting. And if that's the case, um, you can do this in private. I've confirmed that with both Mary 
um, and other communities that have um, that have had this type of training. We know the school board has had this type of training and they've done it in, a, in private session as well. Um, if you insist, I'll call a lawyer, but I didn't want to add to the cost of this if you don't have to. Um, I know I've mentioned to several of the people on uh, work that this would probably be, a, you know, the recommendation was going to be that this would be in private. Um, I think that that organization supports the privacy of this. Mary strongly believes it should be private. She said, you know, this isn't a, this isn't meant to be something that humiliates people or puts people on the spot. It's, it's a, something that we want to encourage some free flowing ideas and conversation. So if you're happy with that, I would recommend that, well, the training should be in completely private. Whether or not you want to hold a select board meeting and do a consent agenda and a you know, public or whatever, but I'm fearful that the public sometimes takes a half an hour or five mm. minutes to get to it. And the question would be if you want to move up the training at all. When we first talked about it, Mary was suggesting that the training would be two hours and then potentially another meeting for two hours when she put the proposal together. And then in the emails to me, she's rethought it and she feels that a three hour session at the beginning is best. So uh, uh, she's, if it's going to be in the <clears throat> evening hours at all, and she would define that anytime after four o'clock, it will involve her staying here. She doesn't want to have to drive back to where she lives late at night. She said she used to do that, but now that she's a little bit older and wiser, she doesn't like to do that. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, if the board wants to consider moving it up, I don't know if it could be for the board members or not. Those are the things you've got to decide. Mike, are you unavailable the 21st? Um, I can't. Problem is, before this, and I guess I didn't realize when I orig we originally scheduled this, I'm kind of in a bind because, um, not contractually, but I have another organization that I'm working the whole weekend through Monday. We have, I have to break down down in uh, Chipping Point down in Orwell. So I could probably be back by a normal meeting time of seven. I know that's going to place us at a seven to 10 o'clock meeting, which I know is a little bit late. I know Bill said if you, you know, and I may be able to get back a little sooner. It all depends upon how long breakdown time and, and getting the stuff back to the Derby headquarters and stuff like that does happen. But, right. Well, seven to 10 is not a problem for me. I mean, right. select board used to meet from seven till 11.30 yeah. in the old days. So <laughs> I don't turn into a pumpkin at 10 o'clock. No, I I, some board members, um, some board members feel that, you know, going until 10 is a little bit late. So it's really your choice. Well, you're saying seven will work for you, think. I it would be real close. If if I not, I might be and, and I would also recommend that we have this as just the sole. I don't yeah. think we should have you know any auxiliary time for consent, you know, unless there's some overall no, just emergency. Saying, don't have a meeting, just right. have don't have to have the meeting is free. I agree. I agree. Uh, are you both available on the yeah, and I'd, I'd, happy, I'd be very happy to push it later to have yeah. one might be able to be there, even if you're a few minutes later or whatever. Yeah. yeah, and that's why I talked to Bill about that. I I think I can make it by seven. I promise any earlier would be really a stretch. Um, and then do the board, do the board see kind of what the training entails? I think it probably sounds like it's very mm -hmm. thorough. I'm glad we're adding an hour. Yeah, I was very impressed with the trainer's qualifications. It just seems, and I think this is long overdue, and I'm glad it's happening. Okay, so we do need to make a motion, I believe, for the expense and okay. everything. So, if someone else can talk. I make a motion to approve $1,400 for the equity and inclusion training on Monday. July the 20th, June the 21st, 
and um, that the meeting be in lieu of the normal select board meeting in a private setting. Okay. Is that work of the motion? Yeah, as long as Kelly puts estimated at fourteen hundred dollars in right. cases, okay, and sixty-five dollars. Yeah, <laughs> you find that being fine, but that you can stay at the White House. <laughs> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, moving on, we are moving up the reorganization of finding the zoning development. Yeah. Did I have this to? So, um, can we just let Nick know that we moved up the zoning discussion? And so, you'll be up next, Nick. Okay. We changed the words of your topic. This is uh, change the yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 We moved it, but now oh, item A is under. Oh, great! <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just for you, Mark. Oh, here's a special and, and, and for Steve too. Um, I reported to the board a couple of weeks ago that being a book buyer baker, our zoning administrator for the last several years, is retiring on July 9th, and. Um, you know, the zoning and planning office has been a very busy place uh, for the last several years, including the pandemic year. Uh, you know, there, there was a lot of activity that occurred. And, um, you know, we have a standard, um, a standard organization, if you will, under the Vermont state statute where we have a community planner and communities are not required to have a planner, even if they have zoning that, you know, we, we had zoning one before we ever hired a, 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 a planner, uh, but zoning requires a zoning administrator. Um, so I talked to Steve a little bit about, is there a possibility to uh, make the offices, the planning zoning department a little bit more efficient? Um, and I'm not here to cast dispersions, but there's there's a couple of things that, in my estimation, have fallen through the cracks over time. Uh, enforcement is one of them. Even though we've just taken some actions recently to enforce, um, you know, the if you want to call it a junk error overall in the court, um, and you know that's been an issue that has been ongoing for. Uh, a couple of years now, when we start and stop, and finally we ended up moving forward on, on that. Um, and then, you know, the issuance of zoning permits, um, more and more, um, there are permit requirements that when people uh, make application for a permit, they've got to go through the DRB process. We've got to have um, staff reports written to get to the DRB. So anyway, I talked to Steve about reorganizing the department, whether there was any uh, ability to do it. And he talked to me about some uh, examples out there in other municipalities where they have a um, uh, planning zoning director and then they have an assistant administrator. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Steve in a second, but really um, what this would give us is basically two people that would be able to act on permits and do enforcement. And we would hope that uh, we would get a little bit more efficient in our, in our process. And um, I, I put Steve in charge of administrative oversight of Dina back a year plus ago when Dina was reappointed to the, to the uh, position of zone administrator just to try to give her a little bit more administrative support uh, to help out. But now we've got to go through the process of um, hiring somebody else. And this might be a good time to consider it. So the first thing I had Steve do, and I apologize, I should have set this up to the board uh, 
at least by Friday, if not before. But back in May, when Steve and I first talked about this, I asked him to put on paper um, what I just talked about, how this would work. And then I took it and I sent this memo that Steve wrote to me, to Joe McLean, who is uh, our attorney, who helps us a lot in zoning and planning um, issues. And, and David Liu is one of his associates. And they does a lot of partnership, uh, you know, enforcement or uh, appeals and things like that. So the reason I felt I had to send this to Joe uh, is that Wandering operates under the general laws of the state. We don't have a charter except for the charter that the King of England granted us back in the late 1700s. So we operate uh, completely by what the state statutes say. In, in Vermont, municipalities can only do what the statutes allow them to do. And one of the things that I thought was going to be applied in this ordinance potentially is the fact that, as Martha knows, and those of you who were on the board a year ago, you know, uh, when, when we hire a zoning administrator, it's the only municipal position that the town manager does not appoint. Um, the process for hiring a zoning administrator is the planning commission nominates a candidate to the select board, and then the select board takes that nomination, considers it, and then the select board can either approve it or disapprove it. They can't say, well, we want Katie instead of Danny. They can say, no, we don't want Danny. And eventually they might get their candidate. But um, I was concerned. I said, well, how do we put this in place where we would essentially, what I'm looking to do is to have Steve to be the planning and zoning director, and then we would hire somebody else to be the assistant zoning and planning administrator. How would we go about doing this um, if the planning commission didn't agree? Because I think that they still have to have the nomination process. So Joe McLean looked at this and said it can work, but the short circuit is still that planning. You still have to go through that process. So if the select board is amenable to this, and I think Steve may have talked to the Planning Commission a little bit about this, but if the select board is amenable to this um, plan, then I think um, there'd be a, a, a more direct outreach from me and, and Steve to the Planning Commission to get their input to see how this might work, because the Planning Commission will have to nominate the zoning the, the person who's going to be the lead person. And it's a little awkward because if the planning commission doesn't want to do it, and I want to hire Steve for this new position, the planning commission says no, well, then it's no, and it doesn't, it doesn't work out. And I don't say that with any uh, you know, bitterness. It, it's the law, that's the way it works. So there will have to be a conversation with the planning commission about this. Um, so, Bringing this to the select board to get a little bit of input from you right now is what we need. I did ask Steve to um, actually write two new job descriptions for each of these positions. We got to that uh, late Friday. Um, I haven't even had a chance to review them yet, so we're not going to we're not going to uh, look at the zone uh, the job descriptions tonight. But with that, um, I guess I'll turn it over to you briefly, Steve. Sure. If you want to say anything and then let the board ask some questions. And this is really the time where if you don't like this idea at all, you just tell us and then you go a different direction. So. Okay, good. <laughs> so um, this idea really started back when uh, Dina was uh, brought up for renomination. The zoning administrator position is a three year term by state statute. So um, she came up to her three-year period after she was initially hired and nominated and then appointed by the select board. So um, there was a lot of discussion with the planning commission around this uh, process, and ultimately Dina was um, nominated and then appointed by the select board. There was caveats as far as um, uh, reporting back um, to the to the select board 
um, in the planning commission in terms of progress. But one of the ideas that came out of this, and uh, Ken Bellavo, who was the chair of the planning commission at the time and had been the planning and zoning director in Williston, said, look, uh, in Williston, we ran into some issues and decided that it would be, uh, this was in 2015 when he was the planning director, uh, they had coordination issues and trying to figure out more of a teamwork approach. They have a larger staff, they have a four person office, but um, Ken became the zoning administrator along with the planning team. I'm sorry, he became the director. He, became, he was already the director of, um, of planning and zoning, but he was appointed to be the uh, zoning administrator and then another one of the staff was hired to be the assistant um, zoning administrator and fulfill that role. Now, Williston has a charter, so they were able to do that under the charter. The municipal manager was able to um, make these hires and appointments. Um, Stowe has recently gone through uh, the reorganization. Uh, Tom Jackson is retiring. He's the uh, long-serving planning director. Uh, Rick Baker, who uh, Dina's husband was the zoning director, he retired. And now they've reorganized where Sarah McShane, who is currently the um, zoning director, is becoming the planning and zoning director. And then they're going to hire an assistant. Uh, it will be a assistant planning and zoning, um, planning and zoning administrator. So, um, and so it has a charter as well. They have so, a charter as well. So they, so, they don't have the right. same issues. So, yeah. So, um, so I presented this to Bill and I, I presented the scenario that Bill uh, painted and he said, well, we're going to talk to the attorney. I mentioned this to the planning commission. We didn't have the opinion from the attorney yet. So I was kind of uh, hesitant with the planning commission, but I said, look, we're, really, we're looking at reorganizing the department. This is an opportunity being is retiring. And we really want to create more of a teamwork approach. And, with the development review board, this is the way we operate currently, where Dina and I team up, um, all handle certain projects, do the preparation, do the staff reports, present it to the DRB. Uh, you don't have to be the zoning administrator to do that. Uh, Dina will handle um, a couple of the other projects, and, and it makes for a more effective approach. Uh, when things are very busy, and they have been very busy. So what this would do is it would expand that to uh, include all permitting, it would expand it to include enforcement, and the, it would allow uh, me as the, uh, if I became the, the planning and zoning director to uh, basically organize the workload, uh, delegate to the, the planning and zoning, the assistant planning and zoning administrator, uh, delegate projects, uh, um, applications. Uh, it allows for collaboration. Dean and I already collaborate in terms of uh, applications that um, may need to, uh, are not clear how they should be handled, how they should be referred to the development review board, whether we need legal advice. So it really creates more of a teamwork environment, which I think is very beneficial. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, because what I'm hopeful for is that it puts us in a position that we have two people that can actually do the work of the zoning administrator. So right now, um, when the zoning administrator is absent, so when Dina was furloughed last year, Steve became the zoning administrator. We already got that in place. If Dina goes on vacation, Steve's the zoning administrator. But when Dean is here, Steve can't do any work of the zoning administrator. So if he gets a complaint or if I get a complaint and talk to Dina or Steve about, well, there's an enforcement issue out there. Under the current configuration, only one of them, only Dina, when she's here, can do sign permits, issue permits, refer things to the DRB, take enforcement actions and the like. And what we're hoping to do in this fashion is to be able to allow the director to delegate some of these things and Clearly, when people go on vacation, the other person is pretty vested and can do it all. But we'll have two people that can actually issue permits. Um, the, the permits will be issued in the name of the director, I'm sure. But um, you know, there can be enforcement actions taken. So I'm I'm correct in my hope that there 
is two people that can right. actually take action. So, right? that, that's true because the statute is set up with with three options: the zoning administrator position, assistant zoning administrator position, and an acting zoning administrator position. Now we have the zoning administrator and the acting zoning administrator only acting in the absence of the zoning administrator. When you set up a system with a zoning administrator and an assistant, they both have parallel authority. And I think they'll actually, the assistant zoning administrator could issue a permit. They can take enforcement action. Right. And if there's an appeal of a decision, then that the, the person, the staff member who has issued a denial, let's say, of an application because in their mind it doesn't meet the zoning uh, regulation requirements, um, then when it goes to the development review board under appeal, that person can defend their decision. And then the other person can step, step into the staff's role and advise the DRB and work with them around deliberation. So it allows for that um, separation of roles um, as well. So I think it's really two parallel positions. And then the other piece that um, the attorney recommended is that it's very important that the duties of each position are outlined very carefully. And um, that, that will be um, in the job description. And I think the, the idea is uh, I draft the job description is to have all those duties We'll get the attorney to review them, then we'll go over them with the planning commission, get the planning commission input. Um, I've talked to Alyssa Johnson, and I have a chance to talk to you about the part of yeah, because it's all been very much in flux, but we would present that. We talked a little bit about it at the last meeting, but I would present this plan. Maybe Bill might be willing to join me. We present it to the full planning commission, say, you know, what do you what is your view of this? Um, you would be in the role of nominating essentially two positions and making a recommendation. But with the assistant, it would be more of an open advertisement for a position. Uh, we have candidates, they would be interviewed by the planning commission. The planning commission would make a, a recommendation and a nomination, and that person would come to the select board. And full disclosure before you might have a question, like, you know, if you did this, um, it, would, it would, it would, in my mind, it would necessitate an increase in pay for Steve because he would have additional duties and responsibilities that he doesn't have now. In full disclosure, when I first talked to Steve about this, I mean, we're still, I mean, we're still dealing with a pandemic and revenues and the like. Uh, we're a busy office. Um, Dina has been working uh, still now uh, from, from home a couple of days a week. Um, and when Dina was hired, she was hired as a 30 hours, I believe it was when she first came on. And that's where it up to now 40. And, you know, uh, my hope, and I'm not going to hold out for this, but when I first talked to Steve about it, I said, well, you know, I think it would require a pay increase for you if we did this, but maybe there's an opportunity to roll back some of the hours for the for the zoning administrator because now there's two people. That may or may not work given the, the workload, and that's something that we'll have to talk with the planning commission about and potentially even the DRB to see if that's in the cards. Um, but um, I think that's all I wanted to say tonight. If you have questions, you certainly. Point out of that. Steve, who do you look at? Who do you see in this new setup as being like the lead for the DRB, you know, guiding them and, you know, leading them in their meetings? Well, uh, to be honest, Mike, it would, uh, the two staff person people would team up. If it's a normal okay. meeting, normally we have three or four applications. That's what we do now. So we're both there. Uh, okay. Dina hosts the meeting right now. And then um, I would take the lead on certain projects. And um, of course, the other Dina can certainly comment, or I can ask her if there's something I'm not sure about. So I would prepare the staff report for certain applications. She would pre prepare the staff report as the new person. And, and we, work, we work as a team. Okay. And it works very well because it's, it's very, Busy getting ready for these CRD meetings these days because there's a lot of going on. 
going on. Right. Uh, usually it takes a day or two of my time, to be honest. Other than that, I can dedicate my time to other things. But uh, so that's how I would just no, that's a, I think that's a good way of collaborative yeah. kind of approach to it. Yeah, so is looking for the same scenario. They haven't had that, to be honest. Um, Rich did all of the preparation for the DRB, and uh, Sarah is a big advocate for this kind right. of teamwork approach. So that's another question from the board. Yeah, well, I will say something. You know, the microphone, I don't know. Well, yeah. pick up fairly well, but I don't know. Yeah, I just have a question. If, uh, if Steve is the zoning administrator, and as I understand, they, who do they report to? Who does the zoning administrator report to? It's an independent position, right? Well, that's yeah, a, that's to a degree. Yeah. yeah. So, so the zoning that I right now, um, Dina reports to Steve. That was put in place a, a, year, years a year or so yeah. ago. Yeah. yeah. Before that, and Steve reports to me. Right. Um, prior to doing that, Dina reported directly to me, but really for only administrative purposes, just for you know time issues and. And questions about you know personnel policies. The and I've talked to Joe McLean about this, and he said, Well, yeah, the you know, I I don't have the ability uh in with Dina as the zoning administrator to deal with uh, if there's job performance issues, I have to bring that issue to the select board and the select board and potentially the planning commission end up. Getting involved. So I can't remove the zoning administrator because I don't have the appointment authority. And even in this case, um, I don't think I would be able to remove the zoning administrator because of how we have to follow general law. But uh, it, it, it is complicated, and you know, it's another reason why, you know, a few of the reasons why I wish we had a charter. There's plenty of other reasons why, like not having to write a charter. Uh, it's, a, it's a good reason not to have a charge, but, but there's a few fine. things that I think are really good. For the rest of time. Yeah, so the, the next one then is, um, you know, no offense to you, Steve, but he's already super wicked busy. Like, we don't get our agendas until the 11th hour. So I'm a little concerned that not doubling, I know you got a team player here. Um, I just think that's the consideration that the planning commission I'll bring up to the planning commission is the additional workload on Steve to bringing in a new person. Even I like the concept. Let me start by saying I like the framework that the zoning administrator is also the planning director, if you will. Um, I don't know what happens with the community planner aspect of your activity. That would be a little bit of a concern. Um, and just because this has been on my mind lately. You know, if we're replacing this assistant, how long into the future until we're replacing or we're, we're refilling your position? I mean, we're all in the team here. <laughs> so if we're doing, you know, one assistant, then we're looking back a couple of years from now, we're looking at a, at a new director or zoning administrator. And so I just think that the select board should think about the grand scheme of things. We all want to retire at some point. And if we're in that close and sequence of stuff, I think we should keep it in mind. Right. It, it's a it's definitely a concern. And you know, Steve's business is is a, a concern that yeah. I have as well. You yeah. know, there's no yeah. question about it. He's very busy. And I preface the start of this conversation by saying we have a very busy office. And um, I think from the the you know the planning commission is Steve's customer when it comes to, you know, agendas and how yeah. quickly they get it and things like that. And, and I'm not trying to dismiss that, uh, Mark, because it's, it's clearly uh, an issue. I think uh, from my perspective over the last, I would say two years, there's been a lot more um, raising of flags saying, you know, the zoning process is just kind of grinding to a, yeah. a halt here. And uh, 
you know, enforcing it has really been a challenge. Um, and, and that's what I'm trying to address here. But that's why I want to talk about it. I just don't want to say this is going to happen. Yeah, but that may also be a personality too. Like we invited Dina. I wanted Dina to come to the planning commission to sort of let's hear what her perspective of how can the position be improved. Just her filling the position, and I was hoping she would have come. Yeah. So that's unfortunate because I think we could all learn from just understanding what her perspective is. Um, what she sees works and what she doesn't. We can take it with a grain of salt, you know. Um, but I think it was, uh, you know, I've I've had to get permits, and I, I mean, honestly, felt the pain. Yeah, and, <laughs> uh, so and it's it, not been great. Right, it's and, not been great. Um, and, and but the issue. But I think you have to look at the job role, not the personality. Yeah, and that's those what we're trying to do. Yeah. And clearly, you know, the last, the last. Four or five years have been at least the example, but some of the issues of permitting and certainly um, um, enforcement predate it goes way back. So anyway, yeah, I, but I think this is a conversation we definitely should have on the next Monday, Martha. And I think in an ideal world, this assistant would assist with planning as well. So oh. I would be able to delegate. Tasks, whether it's something relating to editing some zoning bylaws that, that um, you know someone with good editing skills could yeah. handle, or um, for some other research project. So uh, ideally, this person would fill that role. But I think Bill and I are going to have to talk about how this workload is part of it. Yeah, look, I only came to listen to what the select board had to say. I don't really want to oh. put my input here because I'll get that opportunity. No, that's, that's okay. That's, but I want to be yeah. the select board thought. But to be clear, it almost sounds like in this scenario, we're almost training your potential right. replacement because there is that component of the planning side and zoning that they would still have. If you were to leave, they would almost, this almost sets up a path, but cleaner it, than. It could, it could. I don't know. Like I, 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 it could, but I think, you know, certainly a planner of. He's got the credentials that Steve has. I mean, he's educated here, yeah. planner, he's got a master's degree. Um, and you know, um, so it, it may be that we're fortunate we get somebody who's got the ability or the credentials that you want. But um, anyway, I'm not saying no to that, Mark. Right. I'm yeah. just not saying it's absolutely you know training Steve's replacement. Yeah, I think it is true though. Um, I'm retiring uh a year from next March, so just so everybody knows. So that is in my uh, game plan. I'll have 30 years in here. And um, I won't tell you how old I'll be, but I'll be <laughs> involved the number seven. But anyway, um, so what I wanted to say is I do think um, that trying to put um, a structure, a reorganization in place that will work well moving into the future is difficult. So, um, and I think it will be interesting when the conversation comes up with the planning commission. I know Alyssa is a proponent of the charter. So that issue may come back to you at a, at a later time, but I think we can make this work. I think the supervision can work. I've worked closely with Bill for like 28 years now. So I think we'll continue that, that supervisory uh, relationship. So if you know that date, which I appreciate, I think that's for planning purposes. That's like yeah. That's a really good time. Sure. Um, is there a scenario that makes sense to try to consider increasing? I mean, I know it's not the eventual idea of the assistant and director, but should we be looking for almost like two director for the one year to get them fully up to speed and then bring an assistant mm -hmm. behind it? Like spend a little bit more money, or we're going to go get an assistant and then you move on. And I don't know. Right. Well, again, my memory might be short and the calendar moves a lot faster. Steve <laughs> talked to me about his end date quite some time ago. And when he just said that, I said, well, that kind of spoils any attempt to maybe try to hire somebody for 30 hours. I think maybe, right. yeah. maybe at this point, if that's the case, if you're less than two years from retirement, I apologize I forgot that, you know, maybe it is something that we uh, have a planning director and an assistant, you know, planning director and whatever. <laughs> planning and zoning director and assistant planning and zoning director. 
uh, maybe the person you try to hire now has the credentials that you might want to see and do your, your eventual replacement. Seems like a worthwhile investment, and it also already sounds like workload is a concern. So why try to do a 30 out of work? If we are concerned about that workload, you know, start off and set up for success for both positions, you know, and that'll be 40 hours. Well, those are details. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll do before we get to the it sounds like collaboration, communication is something that many, including our municipality, struggle with. So I see this as a huge benefit moving towards collaboration and shared workload. And I'm curious if you see any benefit that existed to having the separation or if there's no real. When you say separation, you mean of the current? Of the, 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 the current set, the current position. The so legality around me not being able to do so. Well, um, Okay, I'll tell you a little story. Um, as a fellow named Jeff Kilgore, who some of you know, I know very well, who was uh, the attorney here in town, now retired, who was the president of the trustees for, of the village for quite a long time. And he, he was a great advocate for the planner not having to do enforcement and told me that a number of times. He said, look, you're the planner. You shouldn't have to be doing enforcement with some of the same people that you're doing planning with. So um, that is really the main, to be honest, from my perspective, that's the advantage of having two separate positions. Beyond that, I don't see a whole lot of advantages. And to be honest, um, you know, when it comes to enforcement, sometimes, um, you know, I've, I've been involved in enforcement and you just have to sit down with people as a one, on a one to one basis and talk about what needs to happen. Right, but, but I think with the, the way yeah. that we are structuring this, right. even if you wanted to keep one of them more away from enforcement than none, yeah, the fact that the the other individual has both both um, job descriptions would be broader, and there'd be the ability to, to help out. Yeah. So you could yeah. you could it's still good. segregate that, but the the planning director couldn't be issuing permits and, and, and things. So I, I think it can work. Yeah, I think it can. That, that's the main advantage I think of having it separate. Right. Because there was talk and Steve, you know, when we first hired the planner, we had zoning administrators. The zoning administrators were, were very part time in those days. And, and as always happens in municipalities, there were some board members who felt well, why don't we just have a planning and zoning administrator and have one person do both jobs, which happens in many communities. Um, and, and that's where Jeff kind of came in and said, hey, we need a separate uh, zoning enforcement officer. So, to Mark's point, and I mean, I've recently been preaching some of as well. Can someone remind me, how does it like the, the steps of process for a permit? Who, who Creates is it the planning commission or is it your role? Because I do feel like there something doesn't seem right there, or maybe I missed how permits go. And I just not just getting permits from other towns. I did recently go through one, so I felt like it was a little smoother. I don't know exactly why, but I do feel like I've heard feedback from people felt like they struggled to get through the permitting process smoothly. I don't know if it's a personality thing or if it's the steps or something within our process, but I think that would be one other thing I'd be very interested in is if we found someone that has education and some experience that could spend some time also in that year of overlap, mm -hmm. talking about reviewing our process, getting feedback from people that have been through it, and even I'm sure the DRG members and planning commission have feedback on it as well. And then the next person that takes and carries that on to the next, you know, director is behind. Maybe the work that could be done in the next, you know, year and a half, whatever, or however long it takes. But it seems like that's something that would be very worthwhile, mm -hmm. and then maybe make your workload and their workload and the assistant's workload somewhat easier because maybe we're just there's something wrong there, creating more work than it needs to be. Well, yeah, I think there's a number of things. Some some departments are very automated; they have uh, permit databases that. Uh, once you put all the data in, it virtually issues the permit for you and you sign it. So set up that way. Rich Baker is an expert with these systems. So that so that's one option. The other is really a customer service oriented process where um, 
the, there are um, kind of prescribed uh, process deadlines. Statute prescribes some deadlines. And one of the issues we've had is not meeting some of those statutory deadlines. Yeah. So, um, but I think um, I think we do very well in the DRB process, getting things referred to the DRB and getting things through the DRB. That's where some communities have a lot of struggles that it takes them forever to get through a development review board approval process. So I think we do well there. Where, where I think where we struggle is with that administrative process of getting an application in, getting it referred quickly, um, getting the permit, you know, as soon as it's complete, getting that permit out within two weeks or less. So that's where we struggle. And it's a customer service issue that I think we'll, we'll definitely want to, you know, correct as we move forward. And that's where personality and, and style come in. I mean, we've had some zoning, and it's a challenge because, you know, I've been here a long time, Steve's been here a long time, and sometimes you get a zoning administrator and, you know, they all read the, the statute that says the zoning administrator has to interpret the bylaw literally. But the word interpret is still in there, and some people interpret it literally, but they're pretty easygoing about it. And there's other people that know it's a really narrow, you know, you got to really hit a, a really narrow window in order to get, uh, you know, your application approved. Deemed. And that's where I think sometimes, and again, I'm not, I'm not trying to be critical of Dina, but there are some zoning administrators who uh, will just say, well, you haven't submitted this yet, so your application isn't isn't complete. I don't have to act on it until you get this in. And so it's part of the process when it comes to hiring to ask the right questions and, and to try to impart um, some philosophy from the municipality. I mean, told Steve and Dina many times, you know, from my perspective, that that you ought to uh, you know, we've got bylaws that we have to uh, use to regulate things, but your first deference should be to the property. So if there's a gray area and you're on the fence, whether it's the issue or not issue the permit, issue the permit and let the people who might not like it be the ones that appeal the permit, as opposed to saying, well, these people might not like it, so I'm going to deny it and make the property owner appeal the, the, the decision. So anyway, but that's getting into the weeds. Where do we go from here tonight? I don't think, unless you want to kill the, the concept, you really don't have to do anything. If you don't like this at all, then you need to tell us that. Or just have an issue with the continued conversation or time submission. I just do have a question. My brain's been going back and forth <laughs> on this. If there's this new position, this kind of team appropriate a director of planning and zoning is that person hired by the planning commission both of these positions both will have all dominated so that would have to get a recommendation we would have to see that and then ultimately your position would then be somewhat governed by yeah the, by the planning the, I, the, I, that's uh, what zoning. the zoning administrative portion of the job would have to be nominated by the planning commission. And there's no way to get it separated. Mm -hmm. The only way is charter. Yeah, it's charter. Probably won't have that by July 9th. No. Yeah. 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 But but they the planning commission can come to the site board and say we don't think sorry, this is what we're talking about. You know, Steve should have this power and whatever it is, this role and pull back, right? If they really came to a point they could ask for that part of that job. Well, person, right? they could they could do it once the term. I think the term mm -hmm. still, oh, so still well still exists. The, right? the select board can remove for cause. Can remove the design administrator or the assistant design administrator. It would be those responsibilities. Those responsibilities that that zoning. Right. Yeah. So in theory, if something really went awry, yeah, you you could uh, take right. the zoning administrator. Hours away. But if the if the planning commission just soured on the individual during the course of the previous term, they would just have to wait for that. What about the assistant? Well, it's the same, same, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Same. yeah. You're going to have to nominate two people. Yeah, that's what I thought. I just wanted to hear you say that. Yeah. 
<laughs> that's what I want. Yeah, I was a little confused yeah, about that. Right. Okay. Well, okay. We'll, we'll, so we'll bring the we'll bring the plan commission next Monday, and then we'll come back to you at some point. Um, that will be it. Would, would you guys like any of us to be in the planning commission meeting? Well, it's a public meeting. I know it's a public. You're know welcome can. to attend. I, yeah, I'm the same. I was wondering the same thing, but it's really not my role. I know we're always invited. I know we're always invited, but would I'm you thinking. like one well, of us to be there? Are yeah, you I, presenting it to the planning commission to make a decision? Well, or are you just introducing it? I mean, the main reason like I'm that. here is because I hadn't heard the details, and I'm kind of like, I don't want to show up Monday night and not know any of the details. So, uh, are you? Going to be asking the planning commission, or are you just presenting the concept? Well, I think because the planning commission would be, um, in essence, nominating me as the zoning administrator um, for that portion of my job and nominating an assistant, I I think we need to present the concept and see if it's right. supported. Right. Yeah, and I don't think it should be. Well, I guess where I'm headed here is I think that the presentation is. Hey, we're looking at reorganizing the department, keep the personality individuals out of it, but we want to have this dual yeah. team. And uh, I mean, I'm going to advocate heavily for it. What I would, what I would also hope is that your meeting is next Monday. Yeah. Yeah. A week from the week right. point. Yeah. So I'm hopeful that I'll be able to read the job descriptions that Steve put okay. out and then get them to the attorney. And get him to make say, yeah, this works or this has to be yeah. And we can, Steve can present the actual job descriptions to the planning commission as well, which I think will help inform the um, the direction we'd like yeah, to go. Yeah, I guess it just sounds like a two step process, sort of like what you're doing here. You present it to the select board, and then you know, the select board's going to wait to hear from the planning commission. So you have to present it to the planning right. commission. So right, but if the system. if the select board wasn't interested, then there would have been no reason to bring it yeah, to the plan. I don't think that's a good and then, as we know, Dina's end date really have we even started to put any word out? No, there we, we, we we haven't yet, and one of the reasons we haven't yet is because of this. And we're you know I'm not I don't want it to go on for a long period of time, but. It's very unlikely we will have, whether it's this new position or if it's just the zoning administrator, it's unlikely that we're going to have somebody by July 9th sure. on board. Uh, Steve is already the acting zoning administrator when the zoning administrator is not present. So he'll just continue that and you know we'll get someone hired as quickly as we can. But I'd like to I'd like to advertise knowing what we're advertising. No, no, no. Like we have to quickly decision on how it is. Right. Now you're gonna continue to get next one. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of the things that's okay. Uh, <laughs> was a blessing and a curse in May that we had five month five Mondays in May because there were you know, we lost a week's mm -hmm. we could have done this a week ago if it was a regular uh, you know gave me more time to write the job description. So <laughs> Okay, there's no action necessary. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Martha. Thank you. Thanks, guys. All right. Um, Thanks, Martha. Thank you for coming. Recreation, St. Leah, all of Yeah, so Nick is here. Um, I want to give. Uh, an attaboy to Nick. Um, he really went out on his own and uh, you know searched for this grant from um, from Albertsons that that I'm not sure he was planning to talk about. The the what we're really going to talk about tonight here is St. Leo's Hall, but um, uh, I think I don't know if you got this memo from. Did you send it out to them? The one, the two things that came from Nick. Sure. I think Nick sent it to Nick sent it. Okay. Anyway, um, Nick did reach out and applied for a, a grant, basically a donation from Albertsons for sixty thousand dollars to help with the summer um, 
feeding program during the, the rec camp. And it's a huge benefit. Um, he's already begun working with local restaurants to, to get the food preparation uh, made available. We'll be able to use this money to make sure these kids are, are fed both breakfast and lunch. And uh, we'll be able to spend it locally with some of our uh, restaurants. So I want to give credit to Nick for taking the initiative to get out there and find this money and we'll put it to good use. Um, I think Nick is here really to talk more about the St. Leo's basketball. I did put this in the memo. Um, I felt it needed to come to the board because I wanted to just make sure that um, this was done um, completely transparently. Um, as I indicated, uh, we will be using St. Leo's Hall and Wesley Methodist Church again this summer for our recreation program. It's helpful to have these um, additional venues. Last year it was essential because we had real stringent um, requirements with regard to capacity for, for COVID reasons. Um, but having the three venues allows us to have a, a few more uh, people involved in the summer recreation program. Uh, the Wesley Methodist Church simply is asking us to pay them a rental fee for the building. Uh, that's within Nick's budget. Um, Nick, why don't you talk about the arrangement with St. Leo's uh, that you've had with, uh, with the father of Emily? Yeah. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll back up last year when we got to St. Leo's, we, uh, you know, we secured it when it was under, um, I forget who the previous priest was, but within a week he, um, transferred to Fairfield and father Matthew came in. Father Matthew uh, is a bit younger, and so I was able to convince him to, and he was all on board with it. Um, we paid last year like $250 of our rental fee in line striping their pavement as a basketball court and a street hockey court. So no damage. Uh, he was all on board with it, and then our summer camp was able to now use a basketball court and a uh, you know street hockey court that we usually have at Anderson. Um, at this location, which was great because it lacks a playground and, and, and some other things, though we do have the, you know, I've secured a permit from the, the state to use the horseshoe complex for that grassy field, but, you know, we still lack some other play structure. So it's helpful. Father Matthew brought in a hoop that he had, and then uh, we brought in a donated portable hoop. Um, it, it broke at the end of the summer, but we, we got two years out of it. Um, this year, I've negotiated with Father Matthew to kind of kind of do the same terms and put more of a permanent hoop in there. So we've allotted two hundred fifty dollars a week rent, two thousand dollars for the summer. Um, that's very loose. He's already allowed us in the building to start setting up, and he'll allow us in there throughout the year if we need it for little things. But um, you know, we budgeted two thousand dollars for it. Um, I found a uh, pretty industrial. I don't know what the word would be for commercial. Um, it's meant for more use, like the ones that we have down at by the pool house, the the, the basketball hoops down there. You know, an in-ground system that isn't just one that you buy, you know, off your off your your uh, your driveway or something for your kids to shoot on. Um, they're pretty pricey. I found one for twenty eight hundred dollars, uh, comparable to what we have in town, and uh, with our municipal discount through our uh, our our BSN sports rep. We get it at $2,300. Um, Father Matthew has agreed to let us, if approved, pay um, for the hoop um, and we would install it. I already have concrete budgeted for the year for some miscellaneous projects like this. Um, he would then cut a check for the additional $300 um, to the town and um, our $2,000 rental fee would then be used to improve this property versus just us giving them $2,000 and, and they do whatever they want. Um, so from a communal, community and, and rec standpoint, it's a, it's a win-win that they're allowing us to do that. Um, it, you know, on the contrary, we give Wesley $1,500 for a bit smaller space and we just cut them a check and, you know, that goes into whatever they use it for. It doesn't really get, we don't really see that in, in return. So 
Um, this seems like a good deal. Someone, if, if there's any, um, you know, points that someone wants to bring up that I hadn't thought of. Um, I'd yeah, love so the, what I want to be transparent about, I think this, you know, this makes sense. It's it, the cost to us is going to be $2,000, which we can cut a check to the, to the church. And that's the end of it. Uh, Father Matthew is looking to improve the facility so it can be used uh, more often, not necessarily just by us. This, this basketball goal would be a permanent fixture on their parking lot, basically. Uh, so we'll be using municipal money to put this basketball goal on private property, and frankly, it will become their property. Um, and you know, if, if down the road we don't have rec programs at St. Leo's Hall, we're not going to go down there and pull the thing out of the ground and move it somewhere else. So I just want to make sure that the select board is aware of this, uh, see if you have any concerns about it. I, I think um, from the perspective of basketball use in the community, Nick, that there's a need for another court, right? People, it will get used even outside of rec program. Yeah, absolutely. We just put a, we just lined a new court in front of the rec building on that new pavement um, because there's just a demand for, for basketball space right now. Um, the court at Anderson is, is overly used um, and uh, it just space in the village is, is limited. So Father Matthew, yeah, I think Bill just said, but Father Matthew's allowing us, you know, pending you know everything's respected his property the community is allowed to play um on that that hoop um and they have on his hoop that he has there now he's allowed some pickup games going on like a, on a, a weekly basis up um on his on his court that we painted there and then the, that portable hoop so i, I he everything he's he said that he would be continuing to allow that throughout the year in addition to our rec program you know um assuming that it's respected. Any questions? Well, I think you missed a great opportunity for a pun by not calling the plan a slam dunk, but <laughs> otherwise, I fully, uh, I think it's great. I, my mind, and I don't think it's a reason not to do it because we'd be paying them rent to use the space, but I just think about like using municipal funds to make purchase something for a religious organization. It is not religion based. It's just that it's a church and we're purchasing things for their property. I understand it's community use. I don't think it's something we should not do. It's just something that I think about and I don't know like well we would be purchasing it because right. we would get the discount. So we're directly writing the check and that's the question here versus okay. if we gave them the two thousand dollars, they'd have to pay twenty eight hundred to purchase. And then they don't have, they don't have the yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess I, I recall some Bill if he sees any problem with this, yeah. but I, I don't see a problem with it. And it makes sense, and it sounds like this hopefully will be an ongoing ability to continue a larger rec program with mm -hmm. a facility that we're not carrying, and right? Right. Yeah, I, I, that's one of the reasons it's here tonight mm -hmm. because it's a church and you know uh, it's municipal money. But I I think based on how Nick explained it, what I just explained to you, uh, I don't you know I can't promise that there won't be somebody out there who complains about it. But I think it is something that's justifiable and reasonable. I don't mm -hmm. think it it you know uh, the Father Matthew isn't asking, you know, people to come down and say Hail Marys before they play. You know, they might throw a Hail Mary pass. <laughs> He's a basketball player, Wrong sport, Bill. Wrong sport. Um. <laughs> <laughs> loaded with um, tonight. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so do we need to make a motion on this? Yeah, I would just make a motion ask you to make a motion that allows us to uh, rent St. Leo's Hall for the purposes of the recreation program, uh, uh, agreeing to the 
terms and conditions that Father Matthew has proposed. So moved. Second. Right. Moved and second. Any further discussion? I just have another question for you, Nick. So if there's basketball hoops down there and it's lined for basketball, is it also lined? I mean, are there also street hockey nets down there for the community to use? No, no. Street hockey nets are kept in the rec building. Those are I, mean, I have to replace those every year as is just with our program's use. So um, I don't think there's any way we can put them down there without them walking um, and not being in the way of the basketball court. But we do bring them for our camp. So they'll, they'll be there through the summer if someone's looking to play. But um, those will go with us. We can use them back at Anderson. No slam dunkers taking down our basketball. <laughs> you need to say anything about the um, the grant? Uh, we, we have a motion. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so we're going to know how first of all the favors. We say aye. 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 Go ahead. Go ahead. You can. Oh, um, yeah, I, I didn't see the email, but I, I'm aware of it. Nick, do you want to say the grant you got? It's Anderson Grocery Store or Anderson? Albertson. 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 Albertsons is Shaw's parent company. Um, they gave us, they just, um, we got a $10,000 grant from them for the van back in um, December, January. Um, and then I, I saw this one, wrote it, and they must have liked this because we got $60,000 for this one as well. Um, yeah, the idea is just to turn around and, and you know, we have St. Leo's, uh, they have a commercial kitchen. Um, you know, I could take this money and, and buy food from Costco, which, you know, we do every summer anyways for like backup snacks and whatnot for kids who are hungry. But um, I, yeah, I could hire a person to cook the food and it would be mediocre. Um, I'll get pricing me cooking the food. It wouldn't taste that good. Um, but I was thinking it'd be a way if we just use the kitchens in town, use the restaurants and, um, and put it out there um, almost like, like a bid you know up to bid but um kind of divvy it up maybe five six restaurants throughout the week um for breakfast and lunch um and 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 that way it keeps the money local and gets the uh, the experts making the food versus versus me it's a big grant congratulations yeah. Yeah. that's a big deal Thank you. great job great job okay can, um, I, can i ask a quick question yeah nick is it just for food for rec kids Yep. Yeah, it is. I would like to figure it, figure out after I get um, some more of the numbers back, if we can open it up to, um, you know, Camp Coda is the YMCA camp in town. They typically rely on the, the senior center as well for food. They're a much smaller camp. Um, they weren't going to run this year because of low numbers, but I think they have like 10 campers. Um, that's enough. If we, if we, um, if we end up being able to afford the extra few meals, you know, I think we'll do it and have Camp Coda. We'll work on it. I'll reach out to their their, their staff and see if it's something they want to um, come pick up from us or, 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 or however we work it out. But um, if, if there's definitely excess, um, we want to make sure all the kids in town are fed. But yeah, it is for the rec program first. So Nick, was that an expense that the town was paying and this is covering a previously town expense or is this saving the campers money or how's that, how does that it, work? It's, so typically we've been able to offer uh, low incomes, um, low income campers uh, free meal through the senior center uh, and they would get reimbursed through the Department of Agriculture. But um, we weren't able to do that last year and last minute the Barry food program came through um, where meals came from Barry up to um, Carla, what, what's the church name? Is it the Congregational Church? Great Congregational Church. Yeah, and then we would pick it up there and distribute it to the to the camp um those plan a and plan b haven't um really come to fruition and so this was plan c um and we got it so we're gonna run with it it's possible the senior center maybe um you know opens back up to the capacity of what they were doing before but it, from from when we were planning camp um this whole spring it, it didn't seem like that was going to be an option so i um that's what led me to find other solutions just so we can make sure the kids are fed this year and with this grant you know this year we can provide meals to camp all campers like it won't matter if you're low income or not it's uh you know you have no, to spend it all in one year we have to spend it by december 31st yeah <clears throat> but it is non-reportable so um as long as we keep it 
in in how I wrote it. So logistics. Um, right. We can, we can, if there's money left over, there's you know we've got trans we've got to transport the food. There's uh, logistical things that we can spend it on. Well, of course, but you mentioned doing it for all campers because you now have the money. But could you spread this money over multiple? Because every year. It sounds like you have to try to figure out how to feed the low income mm -hmm. campers. That's, I was just wondering if you could maybe spread it out and not have to. No, one of those stipulations is it has to be spent by the end of the year. But we, um, maybe we buy, I'm not going to do, maybe we buy another van, you know, if we have that much money left over at the end of the year. We <laughs> have to spend it. But um, yeah, that's. Nick, Nick, yeah. Nick would you like a, a letter to come from the select board to, for, to Albertsons, a letter of thanks from us? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, this is moved. Pretty yeah, quickly. yeah. This moved pretty quickly. They gave me a whole toolkit to do a sponsor, like a thank you through our social media and our website. Um, there'll be a giant check presentation, um, mm -hmm. at, at Shaw's. Um, but yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't figure out the tie because I knew Albertsons I thought was a Southern chain and I didn't know they were attached to Shaw. So yeah, that's, that's why I said, why is this Albertsons giving this <laughs> Vermont town $60,000? Making deals. But um, <laughs> no, so yeah, um, I'm sure we can do that. The timeline's more this summer. They want to kind of do a, a publicity stunt where they, they're going to one day serve meals to the kids and do a photo shoot. So I think we have time to get that under, under, um, you know, control. I'll I'll probably reach out, but yeah, I'd love to do something like that. That would be great. Great. Thank you. All right. Anything else under that, or we can let Nick enjoy the rest of his night. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Thanks guys. again. All right. Um, consider authorizing short-term intermunicipal borrowing and lending. Yeah, usually I ask for this a lot earlier in the year than um, than than now, and uh, I continue to forget to put it on the agenda. Fortunately, we haven't had to do any intermunicipal or any tax anticipation borrowing yet this year. Um, more for Danny's benefit, uh, we we operate on a calendar year budget, so our, our uh, expenses start in January and. Uh, you know, our revenues are close to 90% property taxes, and we don't bill property taxes until uh, July, and we don't have our first property tax collection until August. Uh, so we have to pay expenses with cash on hand, uh, and then if that runs out, we can borrow in anticipation of taxes. Uh, it's called tax anticipation borrowing. Uh, Typically, uh, in the old days, we used to go to the bank and we would, we would borrow uh, $2 million in January at, at uh, say, 3%. And then we would put it in a savings account or CDs at 5% and uh, use the money over time. And the added interest that we made would be spending the money as, as we went through the year. So it wouldn't be that we would be paying 3% on 2 million and, and earning 5% on 2 million, we'd earn 5% on the balance as it, as it went down. And we could use the uh, earnings on that, uh, on the deposits to offset whatever, um, whatever uh, interest expense that we had. Um, now interest rates are so low that probably about eight years or so ago, we stopped borrowing the money all at once and we just opened a revolving bond credit with the banks. Uh, and now, um, because I'd rather pay money and keep it local if we can, uh, I ask the boards to authorize uh, borrowing in anticipation of taxes and when possible to borrow it from the other municipality in town. So that would be EFUD. So what I'd like to do is have a motion made where the board authorizes um, borrowing and lending for the purposes of cash flow between the town of Waterbury and EFUD in 2021 at an interest rate of 1.55%.
Um, we haven't had to borrow yet this year. Uh, I think probably before the end of, well, sometime in July, we'll probably have to borrow. Um, and our cash has lasted a lot longer this year than it did a year ago. Last year, we started to have to do the tax anticipation borrowing, I think, as early as, as April. So anyway, um, I think more than likely, I looked last year between the middle of June and August uh, 15th, when taxes started to come in, we had to borrow about $300,000. Um, I don't know how much we'll have to borrow this year, but we'll likely have to borrow something. We've got about $32,000 in the bank right now until next deposit, 60000 goes in tomorrow, and we'll have 90000 but we're going to need some, some money. In this way, we'll we'll pay the interest to EFUD as opposed to pay it to the People's United Bank. Any questions? I want to make a motion. How long have you been doing this? I think you said, but I. With EFUD, you mean? Mm -hmm. Oh, on and off, probably for 10 years. Well, I mean, previously, not EFUD. Right. It was the, the village. The village, village. Yeah. Right. So what, what we did last year, for example, is that when I started borrowing money in April for the town's needs, we borrowed from EFOD. And I borrowed from EFOD until it got to the point where it was compromising what they could mm -hmm. pay, because I didn't want them to have to go out and borrow money to pay their expenses. So at some point around uh, the end of May, beginning of June, we transitioned over. I didn't even go to the bank this year to get the revolving line of credit because I didn't think that we were going to be needing it based on what we came into the year with. And um, and EFUD has more than enough money, so I didn't even negotiate with the bank this year. So. Um, I just believe we need a motion. Um, Bill said it earlier, but it's right there. Yeah. Um, is it in your memo? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm working on it. Well, here, I'm gonna find it. I can. <laughs> uh, you give me there was a guy who needs. Yeah. 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 I make a motion okay. to authorize and approve. Uh, tax and fee anticipation borrowing slash lending for cash flow purposes between the town of Waterbury and EFUD in 2021 at an interest rate of 1.55 percent per annum. There's second. Second. Yeah. I have, I have your memo. Further discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Last year we did it at 1.85 percent, so it's a little cheaper this year. I get that in my student <laughs> All right, refunding resolution. Okay, um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. Uh, we talked about it at budget time. In fact, I talked about it back at the special town meeting we had in November of 19 of 2019 when we authorized the purchase of the two fire trucks and the uh, roadside mower. So last. December of 2021, we actually borrowed $1.36 million to fund uh, the fire trucks, the roadside mower, part of Main Street reconstruction, and a few other things that were authorized in uh, town meeting of 2020. I waited as long as I could in 2021 to borrow that money so we wouldn't have to make any payments until 2022. So uh, we borrowed for five years from the uh, Community National Bank at a rate of 1.55%. That's why uh, tax anticipation borrowing, that's a, a good way to pay that number. Um, and we were scheduled to pay that $1.36 million back in five years at uh, payments of about $286,000 a year for five years. Um, the fire trucks and the roadside mower and Main Street all have uh, useful lives much longer than five years. Uh, 
And normally I would have advocated for borrowing over 20 years uh, for this refunding, but some of the board members like to keep borrowing to a minimum. And during our budget time this year, we we kind of tossed out the idea of borrowing for 15 years. And that way, uh, even though the fire trucks have used the lives of 20 years, that will shave five years off the end. So there's a long resolution that I emailed to you. I don't know if anybody had the stamina to read it all and try to understand it, but I have read it several times. I've renegotiated it with both the uh, Community National Bank and Paul Giuliani, our bond council. So I'm recommending that you approve the refunding resolution, which will in effect refinance $1.1 million of the of the 1.36880 uh, lending. Uh, the first payment on that 1.1 will be in June of 2022. Uh, and then uh, we'll get to the allonge in a minute. So um, I had hoped my initial uh, foray with the bank was to get all this done and um, get the select board to approve the refunding resolution now, but have the issuance of the new debt. Uh, we're not going to get any money into refinance, but I was I was trying to get the issuance of the new debt to be in December, just like the old one was. And the bank blocked at that a little bit. And then I tried to get it, you know, in September. But the bank said, well, we really can't um, not um, kind of start the clock running on the interest if we're going to give you a 2% rate for 15 years, which is an incredibly good rate. Um, they said we really need it to be sooner. And if you, you can wait, but we can't promise that we'll keep you at 2%. So we're going to have to make the first, the annual payments on refunding in June. It's not ideal because we'll potentially have to be borrowing in anticipation of taxes in order to make this payment. But to do this, uh, I didn't want to risk with, you know, inflation is really upticking right now. It's over the last 12 months, it's running at over 4%. There's talk about the Federal Reserve, you know, are they gonna up interest rates? And if they do that, then our interest rate on this would go up. So I think we can live with the fact that we're going to have to pay this in June. So I would recommend that you approve this now. Okay. Any questions? What was the amount, Bob? We're refunding one million one hundred thousand for fifteen years at two percent. I make a motion to approve the refunding resolution um, resolution and certificate as prepared by the town manager in the amount of um, $1.1 million for 15 years at 2%. Second. Okay. Second. Further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. I'm going to pass this around, Mike. There's tabs there. There's in some places where all the select board has to sign, there's a couple of places where only the chairperson has to sign. So make sure you sign in the right places, okay? Um, and then there's an allonge, which uh, is a fancy word to say that uh, the, the remainder of the 1.36880 uh, that we had, we're keeping that at the same interest rate but in December of each year, instead of having to pay uh, the $286,000, we're going to have to pay uh, $55,539.92. So in essence, what they've done is taken the original loan at 1.55%, subtracted out the $1.1 million that we're refunding, and then uh, applying a new amortization schedule over five years. So uh, somebody needs to make a, uh, make a motion to approve the allonge 
which um, is uh, part of the, the refinancing of this debt. Can simply move to approve the allonge? Yeah, as presented. As presented. Second. Second. All those or any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, well, that's going around. You can move on if you want to make sure yep. we do this right. <laughs> no, no. I, <laughs> we can Ten. make sure I mean, Mike's signing it. With a sunglasses on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can sign it. Just sign this one. So all we to do on that side. Right? Yep. Right. Um, so this is, that was a pretty huge, um, uh, you know, my, my goal all along was to refund that debt. Uh, we did that with the Perry Hill uh, paving note of a few years ago. We had a $500,000 loan that we took for five years, and then we turned that into a 10-year bond. But at that point, um, we had to go through the Vermont Municipal Bond Bank to do it, and there's a lengthy application process. It's, it takes a lot of staff time to go through that application, and then you've got to, um, you've got to pay the bank for closing costs, and you've got to pay. I mean, we're going to have to pay out our lawyer who, who reviewed and wrote this. But um, I was able to work with the Community National Bank and uh, successfully that them agree to agree to take the 15 year bond as opposed to having to go through the bond bank. So there's a significant savings uh, in, in that regard as well. So I appreciate them all agreeing to do it. Mm -hmm. Savings in terms of fees and costs or? Yeah, both fees and costs and in staff time. Um, I mean, the, okay. the application process for I know, the bond, the bond bank, bank is very huge. interesting. And it takes, uh, you know, it, it takes me, you know, several weeks, of an hour here and an hour there to get it done. Can't just have lunch with Paul Julian. Yeah. All right, uh, employee wages. Um, yeah, so this, you can take as much or as little time on this as you want. Um, the board put this issue in the parking lot, so to speak, back in April when, when uh, raises went into effect. There were some questions asked. Um, you know, Chris was the one who had most of the questions. Unfortunately, you know, I didn't realize he wasn't going to be here this week when I did all this work last week and got this information out. But the board just um, asked to, you know, what's the plan going forward? And the plan going forward is really kind of what the plan has always been. Um, I think from the the, uh, the spreadsheet that I sent out, that you can see that we have never been one organization to give exorbitant raises. Um, you know, they're pretty much been in line with inflation. Um, as you know, I, I put in some information at the bottom and, and you know, you can say, well, over the course of from 2007 to, to now, um, that in the aggregate, some of the, um, the wage increases look like they might be beating inflation by, uh, you know, a percent. Um, but it's it's really for the the board's information, so you can see here um, what what pay rates were, um, and as I said, um, there are several of us that were hired way before 2007, but I have easy access to wage information back to 2007, so I kind of use that as the as the cutoff point. So. Um, if you look at the top line there, that, that first highway department employee um, is being paid $21.50 an hour in 2021. Uh, when he or she was hired, he was 
higher than fourteen fifty, so they're making seven dollars an hour more now than they were before. That's a total increase of about forty eight percent. That person uh, that uh, fourteen fifty was paid to that person in two thousand seven, so that's fourteen years. You divide the forty eight percent by fourteen. That particular person is three point four five percent increase. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know it, and you can see in the next column that I I ranked uh, what position of from low to high that particular individual uh, out of the twenty five employees listed here. Uh, there were only 10 people that got a uh, higher increase than that over, over that period of time. But there were uh, 14 people that got lower than that. So it's just information for the board to, to let you know that, you know, I don't think that we've ever gone hard while in terms of uh, pay increases. And this year's budget, um, the, the, the budget that I put together would have allowed uh, everybody to get a 2% raise and then some people would get more than that based on uh, merit basically. Uh, and a little bit of, you know, when people get promoted or if they're given new responsibilities, there's usually some uh, marginal increase that's given there. But at the, when I presented that, the board said, well, okay on the 2% across the board, but the impression that I got was that they didn't want me to, uh, to do anything beyond the 2%. So everybody except me has got a 2% base. This obviously took a lot of time and work, so I appreciate it, and it's not, I don't think it's for not, even though, you know, I sitting here and he had some questions, like it'll stand. And I think it shows a lot. It, it does speak volumes and it sounded like, oh, this was my first time talking about it, meaning that there have been questions continually throughout the years. And I think this is a good way to talk about them in a fact-based way versus in a feelings-based way. So I really appreciate it. Yeah, I agree. I think it's, it's I gotta, absorbed a little bit to fully understand what we're learning but I think I think Chris's whole thing is it's sometimes hard to separate yourself from the private sector public sector how you deal with increases and in some businesses employees could go years without any increase but then usually that jump in increases you know it's a procedurally it's a little different there's not I mean I'm you know, sure larger companies have boards but you know like Sometimes you wait for the employee to ask, sometimes you do it off the mirror, you try to get ahead of it, depends what style of business you're in. I mean, it's completely industry to industry, it's different. Um, I think, you know, I've been on the board long enough to know that Bill takes every time he comes to the board with the yearly employee request of increase, presents it very clearly, and I feel like it's very fair and it's, it's very thoughtful. Um, I think. We do have similar to the conversation we had tonight that that's his procedure, but we don't know who the next person might be. And there probably is something that maybe we could start to, I'd like to have some kind of conversation surrounding how you, you know, I think you explain your approach, but how that would be, how that could be handed off, or is that really a skill that you learned since you've been here so long? And you know, as boards change, you know, I think I, I don't like that every year there seems to be like contention surrounding, right? Is that like, to me, that's a problem. It's just a disservice to our staff. I think there's an expectation that wages should go up over time, obviously, to keep up with inflation and to represent the work that's being done and longevity in the business. So, and you know, this is a biz town, the town is a business. So it's, it's how do we get away from that? I think is an important conversation and much more of a 
and understanding of the work and then why you're presenting it and respecting that presentation. Um, I don't know another way to do it because that's this is the only way I've seen us do it, but um, I don't know if there is something we should be considering. I don't have a problem with what you've done in the past. I don't I think that one thing that we haven't done as a board is make sure now we have a parking lot, but as Bill mentioned, I think that's the one thing that you your pay typically kind of a separate conversation. Right. And so the board knows, as far as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, like we really should have a, a yearly discussion at probably the same time to discuss <clears throat> Bill get some feedback on our feelings towards his work and then discuss his weight and increases as well because I can tell that it's always that kind of like you know, even here, you know, tonight. So I, I don't know, you know, I don't, I'm just new into this role as the leader of the, the board, but I still don't know totally how to approach that part because I I think there needs to be more conversation in and out of the, the meeting as well or surrounding that, you know, and. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, not a, it's not a cut and dry thing. And I understand the, you know, the, um, the nebulousness, if you will, of it. And, you know, I appreciate you expressed confidence in what I've presented and, you know, that you think that I'm fair and, and that I'm thorough and, you know, and clearly try to be professional with that. Um, one of the things that I tried to um, communicate in the memo was that for a relatively small organization, municipalities in general, there's a there's a broad range of of jobs now I, I don't know anything about the restaurant business and i know you have cooks and servers and you know maybe you have bookkeepers I, I don't know what you have but a lot of businesses have a very narrow range of you know small businesses have you know kind of everybody does the same thing and and in a, in a municipality uh you know we have people that have advanced degrees, we've got people that have special skills. Not to pick on Chris, but I think Chris kind of, when he talks about municipal employees, he thinks about highway employees. And that's all, you know, he, he kind of relates that to what his business is. Um, and, and I think that showing the board and getting the boards to understand and appreciate that there are people with a, a really broad range of education levels, skill sets, and job descriptions uh, is, is important. So it's not everybody, you know, fits the same cookie cutter. It, there, there's a lot of different cookie cutters out there. Now, you know, there are some communities I expect I know the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, and I've been on one board or another of the LCT's uh, and, uh, governing board since 1986. They're not very much bigger than we are, um, a little bit. They've got a whole insurance item. But, you know, what they have done is gone out and, you know, they hire a company to come in and do a whole wage and salary and they do a, a survey, a market survey. Well, that's pretty expensive. And I think it's overkill for, for us. What I try to do is use the Vermont League of Cities and Towns every year or every other year at least. They do a, a salary and benefits survey of municipalities and, you know, every from you know, highway laborer all the way up to municipal manager, finance director, they're listed and you get to see what other communities um, are paying these positions. And I, I rely on that because um, when we, there are a certain class of our employees, when we lose them, we lose them to other municipalities. That particularly happens in the water and sewer uh, wastewater water treatment fields uh, to a lesser degree, but happens in highway departments as well. Uh, we've been fortunate, you know, um, 
a lot of people, and I think we have a relatively low turnover rate, but the turnover rate is higher than I think some people envision. I think a lot of people think that everyone who comes to work for a town stays there for their for their whole career. And certainly when I came here, um, you know, we had a much smaller staff. We didn't have a recreation director. We didn't have a planner. Um, we had only part-time growing administrators. Uh, and, and, you know, we didn't have a library really. Um, and, um, but if you look at this list of when people were employed, and I think I pointed this out in the memo, you know, there's six or seven of 25 that have been with us for five years or less. So, you know, we do have uh, turnover. And unfortunately, I think the turnover is going to accelerate in some of the more High profile positions in the next the next several years, you know, and that's that's going to be a, its own challenge. So you can do with this what you want. Uh, what I would like, and you don't have to say yes tonight necessarily, but I would like to be able to implement the budget that I had put in place, which did contemplate more than a two percent raise. For some people, not not everyone, um, and the fact that that didn't happen in April already is, in essence, saved saved us some money. Um, uh, some of them were going to happen in April, but my my intention from the beginning with with folks like you know I know we're not in the executive session, but I I don't think this will. Come as a surprise. And Nick has done a lot of great work in the past couple of years, uh, and and um, you know what he did last year to just to be able to run a recreation program and to get everything organized and move it all forward. Uh, he did already get a little bit of a bump up there, um, but. You know, there are some positions that sometimes you feel you need to give a raise because you hope to retain that person. You don't necessarily want them going off to the next town or to some other position. So sometimes you, you have to do that. Um, and there are there are positions that are in high demand. And as I pointed out in the memo, the four the four highlighted. Uh, in yellow positions, those are EFUD positions. They're all uh, water, water sewer, or public works director positions. And in almost every case, you know, when when Alec Tuscany retired as public works director, and I hired Bill Woodruff from water superintendent, he got a pretty significant increase in in his pay. Uh, so on this list, if his name was there, you could probably figure it out if you wanted to try. But you know, it shows him with a, a significantly higher uh, percentage increase than the average. But his job description and his duties went up you know, exponentially. And then when his position as water superintendent was filled by an existing employee, that person got a raise. So in the in the E fund, where they're all technical positions, they all require. Uh, state licenses, um, you know, those positions, if you don't keep up with the Joneses, you lose them. So, um. so how do you approach, um, say there's an employee that you have this concern, you feel like they are performing quite well, and, you know, a lot of times around budget season, we talk about this on everyone on a more broader degree, but in that scenario, are you coming to the board? Or how, what's the, well, how do you want to approach that? Because I agree, I think that um, I would hate to lose a staff member that you think is performing well and we may be under pain. So just like any business, I think there's a conversation around retainment and if you can afford it or decide that the investment makes sense. So what is that procedure? So if I, if I thought that somebody really, you know, somebody needed a 10% increase for whatever reason, I mean, I would clearly, I would come to the board for that. Um, what I've tried to do in my time here um, 
is that, um, you know, obviously we, we measure inflation. It's always helpful if you can at least keep up with inflation. There are some years like last year from 2019 to 2020, we didn't do it. COVID was here, it threw a whole monkey wrench into things. We didn't know what was gonna happen. So I told the employees, you're gonna have to suck it up. And you know, uh, yeah, you didn't get laid off. And I know the person who did get laid off is making more money than they made before they got laid off just because of what happened with, uh, with the federal unemployment uh, laws. But there have been times when we haven't been able to get those even cost of living raises. You know, the same thing happened after the after the flood. Uh, we couldn't give uh, a raise, but later in that year, the board agreed to give everybody who was an employee uh, who clearly had worked hard. You know, people got like a five hundred dollar bonus or something like that, just to recognize what they had done. If there was somebody that I felt was really outside of um, cost of living plus a, a reasonable, what I would consider a reasonable bump up for merit, I would definitely come to the board for that. Um, many times in the past when the boards have been able to say, okay, cost of living is 3%, we're gonna give a 4.5%, uh, they, they make 4.5% available, in, in a year like that, where there's a real opportunity for people to kind of take the next step up and get additional pay beyond keeping pace with inflation, what I've done in those years is say, look, okay, highway people or others, you know, um, I'm going to give a higher percentage raise to the lower paid workers, to the more junior workers. So if we hire somebody to be in the highway department, and I'm not taking anything away from somebody who's been working, you know, Randy Guyette was hired in 1986. So, you know, he's the longest serving municipal employee. We have even two years more senior than, than I am. Uh, Randy has a wide, broad wealth of experience, but in terms of doing his base job, driving trucks, plowing snow, maintaining roads, you know, the guy who's been working seven years doing that has kind of caught up on the learning curve in terms of most of what has to be done. Now, Randy might be better, you know, he can, he can do a concrete sidewalk and understands, you know, working with concrete and, and uh, being able to really make a good slump and, and get a, a good product out there better than uh, that newer person. But in terms of the base job, after six, seven years, you, you've kind of caught up. So I told the, the, the staff members, I said, look, we're going to get raises, but if you're making $20 an hour and Joe Smith is making $15 an hour, and you're really kind of providing the same you're at the same point on the learning curve. If I give both of you a 3% raise, you're at $20 and he's at 15, you're gonna get further ahead than the lower. So more of the more of the money in those cases when I have been given additional money has typically gone to the lower paid employees um, because I can tell that more senior person, well, we reward you for your longevity by giving you more leave time. You know, you get four weeks vacation, whereas this person only gets a week and a half or whatever it is. So that's what I always try to do. And, and uh, you know, that, that I think provides, uh, you know, good, uh, it's a morale boost to the lower uh, paid employees because they feel like they're kind of catching up. That, you know, they're not always, I mean, they're pretty much always going to be behind somebody who's been that far senior, but as long as they get closer because they're doing the same jobs, I think that's important. But if there was somebody that I thought really deserved something out of the ordinary, I would clearly come to the board and say, I think we need to do this because of X, Y, Z.
and we don't have to decide all that now. This is, I'm hoping I'm giving you some information that you find is helpful and it can just inform the next conversation. Just this information was useful, but just to add on to some of the comments that Mark made, a lot of people, because I've been on both in the both private sector and the public sector, and just people have to have a realization there is differences between the two. You know, the public sector definitely has a more even base. You, you, you tend to get raises yearly, where sometimes in the private sector, it's more merit-based, but sometimes in the private sector, when a company has a really good year, you get a $10,000 bonus. It doesn't happen in, 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 the, in the public sector. Right. And, you know, pe people just have to realize that. It's, it's trying to make people in the public sector happy with what their jobs are. Sometimes it's not always pay. It's other things that make people. Well, you know, we have good we have good right. benefits. We've talked about that before. You know, decent retirement system, pretty good, you know, health insurance. And compared to many small businesses, the health insurance benefit we get is excellent. But also, please don't forget. And I'm I'm not trying to you know have anybody feel sorry for for me. I chose this business because this is what I. Have a passion to do. This is mm -hmm. this is where I want to be. This is what I went to school for, and, and I was committed to local government. For some people, you can say, well, you know, they're getting they get raises continually, and, and their counterparts in the private sector wouldn't. There are a lot of us who work for municipalities whose whose ceiling for pay is far lower than it would be if I were doing the same job for Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, I'd probably be making more money than I'm making now. I think significantly <laughs> than I'm making now. And, and that's something that that you and the public needs to keep in mind. Oh, uh, well. I know that all the time. It's my job. I would say I could have made a lot more money working in a bank. I didn't, didn't want to do that. All right, uh, nothing to be decided tonight, but no. I think I would like to have a something to talk about over the next two. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, we can just have a continued conversation. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Can we add to the parking lot the question about, you know, Charter? well, no, <laughs> <laughs> that's a long term uh, parking lot. But I, I put the part on there for I, Yeah. I don't mean to interrupt you, but sure. were you saying something about the, the wages? Because I was talking. Oh, about yeah. That. I was just wondering if um, you were hoping us, for us to make any decisions this evening. I know there was a little bit of a discussion you said about um, that the additional increase that we didn't do. Yeah. I mean, if I would love it if the board said, yeah, you can implement what was put in the in the budgets um i there's nothing that uh I, can you remind me what decision we made that didn't allow that or i'm blanking on that yeah idea, but. so um i don't know if we i don't know what the minutes of the meeting would show but when i talked about it my impression was that what i presented um Again, he's not here to defend himself, but I'm not trying to put words in Chris's mouth, but he had some concerns. He felt that, you know, um, municipal employees expect to get a raise all the time, and that's just not how the real world works. And what I heard was the board said, you can give a 2% cost of living increase across the board, but he didn't feel comfortable about it anything more than that so and what was the ask well you're saying that for, for there are some employees who sure. i think should get more than two percent yeah. i don't want to name them yeah, yeah. i don't think that's necessary or appropriate because i'm not talking yeah. about giving anybody you know uh, 15 percent raise or anything like that no, I think I, I agree that it's a, it's a danger to do percentages because of the right. differential. So 
I'm trying to remember up saying that that was what we wanted or that was how we wanted you to proceed. Um, but I understand the concerns on spending and COVID and everything else. But then once we learned that it seemed like financially we were doing well as a town, I think that changes things too a little bit, you know. Um, so I think you don't have to make any decision tonight because yeah, it, it seems like it. there's some questions. There's some other information that I'm waiting for. Um, you probably, if you read the newspapers at all or pay attention to the news, the American Recovery Act, ARPA, I never can remember what the P stands for. Um, uh, there's going to be some money coming our way uh, that, that I will talk with you about at a future meeting. Um, the Congress is trying to pass an infrastructure bill that may indeed really open the floodgates, but uh, there's going to be some additional money coming. So why don't you let me wait to find out how much that is, uh, what what that means, how we might be able to use that, and then I can go back and look at the meeting and remember we can revisit this. So you don't have to do anything tonight. Okay. And that way, Chris can be here when you do it today. I know it's late. You said you want to add something. Add something uh, to the parking lot in regards to um, insurance liability. And we, that we discussed kind of earlier. OK. Yeah. And then pulling things out of the parking lot, racial equity training would probably pull for now. Mm -hmm. Employee wages, we have a lease that we're going to revisit it. Leaving strategy, and I think so we'll leave the rest. Lead strategy? Yeah, we haven't really talked about a strategy. I was going to actually, I knew we were running behind, but I was going to be like, how can we decide to mill? What, what's that decision? I just want to understand how you look your road. And, but we, again, that's part of the whole strategy, but I want to add more tonight. But I think that's, that's more of the conversation of like inventory of roads every year, condition when you make the decision to do the investment on a mill versus full rebuild. And are we keeping up with inventory in our roads so we don't end up fully rebuilding them if we can avoid a cost by necessarily doing the research? But I think that's not the conversation. So real quick, in terms of the orders, I'll start bringing them every other Monday. And Chris Bienz used to stop out at like 6.30, so you'll have jams up here today. Whoever wants to volunteer to find them, and I'll leave them here, or I'll be here at 6.30. Okay. I'll give you a little more instruction as soon as you. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. It took a long time because I never looked at it. What sure about that? Off did it email go off? Off today? weeks, so somebody can stop in. Okay. No, okay. Yeah, off weeks, yeah, um, okay. somebody can stop in Monday afternoon or Tuesday. It's weekly. Yeah. Okay. So, can we still do it by email or just if now it's come in and do it? It doesn't matter. I think it's up to you guys. Either way. Okay. Whatever's easier. I can email them and then if somebody wants to stop. As long as they get done. The problem right. has been an email. Nobody knows it's going to do it and then nobody does it. And then Carol if you email, it's easier because then I can always just add, go, I'll stop in. Yeah. Versus right. I'll definitely forget it. I'll email them. Because I would never have a problem. You know, just like the last one, I happened to be up at camp, so yeah. no internet connection, so it was impossible. Do you email them every week? I, on the off weeks, or doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. you know, on the off weeks, that's good. Yeah, yeah. I, was, yeah. I, was, I couldn't get here last time I was on double. I was like, oh crap, I saw that happen. Yeah. Okay, you guys have Yeah, I'm just drowning. Thanks. Uh, Thank both of you for your service yeah. over this Thank you. tough year. It's it's nice to have see you in person for a change. Yeah, that's good. Thank you for attending. Great. Right. Nice long <laughs> one with it. Um, motion? And a small the old trustee. Uh, uh, well, 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 second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Recording aye. stopped. <laughs> so.